Hello YouTube. Over the years I've covered many aspects of the Elder Scrolls lore, but by far my favorite kind of lore is the lore about Tamriel's different cultures. All these little world building things, things that you might not even think about as you play the games, but the developers nonetheless wrote into this amazing world. Highlighting those details is something that I've really enjoyed over the years and today I've put all of those little details into one big video for your convenience with timestamp chapters in case you want to skip something like this introduction. So. How do the Argonians bury their dead? What's the preferred way of marriage for a Nord? And what kind of music does a Khajiit listen to? You'll discover it all in this long video, as we're starting with the different holidays and festivities all around Tamriel. So holidays, there are many different holidays celebrated around Tamriel, many of which have no other lore about them other than on this day the villagers of Village X celebrate a dragon eating their naughty children, uh, which really exists by the way, it's called the Day of Waiting and it's on the 9th of First Seed in Villages of the Dragon Till Mountains and then they believe that some dragon will come and eat the worst people of the village uh, on that day so everybody locks themselves in their houses. So yeah. Interesting. It's an interesting little tidbit, but it really has no lore substance. So for those small holidays, I will only cover the most interesting ones. So the dragon eating things, but no, on this day, the children of this village pick flowers. Not in my lore video. So that said, let's start with the beginning of the year. The very first day of the year on the first of Morningstar, which is the first of January in our world, which is the new life festival. On this day, the people of Tamriel celebrate the coming of a new year after the passing or in some source called the literal death of the old year. This festival is paired up with another festival, which is the Old Life Festival, which takes place on the 31st of Evening Star or our 31st of December. Together, these festivals form the old and new year celebrations around Tamriel. Celebrations start on the Old Life Festival, which isn't really... A happy celebration but it's a day of reflection upon the past with the tradition being that on this day there will be a solemn remembrance of loved ones which have passed away with the legend going that on this day loved ones that reside in Aetherius may actually answer the call in some way when one leaves a message to them at a shrine curiously in some regions of Tamriel on this day the laws against necromancy are temporarily lifted and it seems that it's legal to try and resurrect recently deceased corpses uh, it's pretty gross to think about um, and it does not seem to be a widespread custom, at least not anymore in the late 3rd era and in the 4th era. And also not in the 2nd era during the Elder Scrolls Online, at least from what I can tell. Uh, it's a pretty grim holiday in stark contrast to the New Life Festival, which comes in the form of an actual celebration with actual feasts and parties. Celebrating Magnus, the deity who created the sun in the Elder Scrolls universe by ripping a large hole in Mundus. Uh, starting his journey to days becoming longer again and celebrating a new life being born all across Tamriel. Actual celebrations and the length of the celebrations vary per region, for example. In most of the Empire, they celebrate the new life festival only on the first day of the new year. But in some places, like in High Rock, they add a second day, which they call Scour Day. Which used to be about cleaning up the festival's trash, but then turned into its own celebration. Meaning that there, the new life festivities essentially take two days. Now, both the New Life and the Old Life Festival have found their ways into Elder Scrolls Online and the Elder Scrolls Blades as seasonal events, uh, usually just coming in the form of XP bonuses and festive microtransactions, sometimes with small quests linked to it or in-game rewards. But other than in those games, the festival hasn't been seen in the Elder Scrolls games since Daggerfall, which isn't too weird as that is the game which introduced the vast majority of all these holidays that I'm talking about today, as None of them have really been used, except in the live service games. Anyway, in addition to the new and old life festivals, the Red Guards have their own tradition near the beginning of the year, between the 14th and 15th of Morningstar, so again January for us, which is called Of Anka, or Of Anka, I don't really know how to pronounce Red Guard words. It's a day of prayer to Stendar, where they pray for a prosperous and more importantly, merciful year ahead. Now, having talked about the start of the year, let's skip to Sun's Dawn, or as we call it, February. 
There are a ton of minor holidays in there, which among other things, for example, remember certain battles of the past, like the Battle of Glenumbra Moors in what's called the Day of Release in High Rock's Glenumbra region, or the Feet of the Dead, where in Windhelm, Isgrimor and his 500 companions are remembered and their names are recited. But my favorite holiday by far of this month is the Day of Mad Pelagius on the 2nd of Sun's Dawn. On this day, parties are held across High Rock, and the Bretons remember the Mad Emperor Pelagius Septim III on Sheogorda's summoning day, and they have parties in the Mad Emperor's honor. I don't know, it's pretty funny. Now, the major holiday of Sun's Dawn is held on Sun's Dawn the 16th, or February 16th for us, which is Heart's Day, which is a day where the love of the legendary lovers Polydor and Eloisa is celebrated in honor of the loving couples all around Tamriel. The celebrations go paired with specific heart-shaped pastries like sweet rolls, of which the Elder Scrolls Legends gave us an example, as you can see on the screen. And in this day, in some cities, rooms in inns and taverns are being rented out for free to visitors in celebration of the ancient lovers. And no, before you ask, we don't know the story of Polydor and Eloisa, unfortunately. But someone on Reddit did a decent apocrypha post on it, so essentially a fan fiction of the story, which I can recommend you to read if you want it, but remember, it's thought up by a fan, it's not actual lore. It's in the description of this video. Anyway, Hearts Day also found its way into the live service game, so the Elder Scrolls Online and Blades with both selling love-themed furniture in their stores on that day. So, with that behind us, let's talk about First Seed, or March, as it's called in our universe. This is the month where my highlighted minor holiday is the Day of Waiting. Remember from the beginning of the video with the dragon eating the mad people? Yeah, that one. First Seed also has the Festival of Blades, celebrating by the Red Guards, who celebrate the Red Guards' victory over mystical gigantic goblins with big feasts. Uh, although the actual historical foundation of that is kind of doubtful. Anyway, the main holiday of First Seed is First Planting. It's basically what it sounds like. A celebration of the first sowing of seeds of the year on the 7th of First Seed. It's seen to the people of Tamriel as a day of new beginnings, where family disputes are settled, new resolutions are formed, and diseases are cured by healers at temples for free, and people attempt to drop their bad habits. Now, the next month is Rain's Hand, or April in our world, and it has three interesting holidays. To me, the most interesting one is the Day of Shame, which is held along Hammerfell's coast on the 20th of Rain's Hand, to commemorate the fact that the people of Hammerfell turned down sick Kathringi refugees during the Kanatan flu epidemic. And this ship that they were on was called the Crimson Ship and was turned down at every port, so the people on the ship eventually died of the Kanatan flu. If you want to know more about the Kothringi, which are a metallic skinned race of humans, or the Kanatan flu disease, I made videos on both. Uh, they're both in the description and in the eye icon, so watch those if you want to know more about those subjects. Now, other than the Day of Shame, we have another highlight, uh, which is the Day of the Dead on the 20th of Rain's Hand, which is a day in which the people of Daggerfall say that the dead may rise to take revenge upon the living. But other than that, we don't really have much more lore on that. What we do have more lore on is the Jester's Festival on the 28th, which is again present in the Elder Scrolls Online and I believe also in the Elder Scrolls Blades. On this day, the people of Tamriel celebrate the weirdness and the foolishness of the world, with jesters and street performers parading around the cities and pulling pranks and weird games on the population. Uh, because everybody is so distracted by these weird games, it's one of the favorite holidays for thieves, as they are the ones taking advantage on the population by pickpocketing everyone while they're participating in weird pranks. Now, what is interesting about this holiday is that it's unclear when or why it started. My personal favorite in-universe theory, so by in-universe scholars, is that it started as an elvish holiday, as the races of elves mimicked and mocked the races of men, which they, well, at first thought to be weird. There are also theories of Sheogorath started it, and Isgrimor maybe even started it, or even the invention of alcohol itself started it. Uh, those are all in-universe theories, by the way, so the things that people and the scholars of Tamriel themselves speculate in the universe. Because in the universe, it's also unclear where this holiday started. Now, Second Seed, or May in our universe, is a bit of a barren month, with the only real highlight of the minor holidays being the Fire Festival in the city of Northmoor in High Rock. 
uh, which is held on the 20th of Second Seed, where people from all around Tamriel come to Northmoor to attend the festival. This festival is a display of magic by powerful mages to the population. It started as some sort of magical conference of sorts with high mages um, who just showed off to each other. But eventually it turned into a public display. If I had to compare it to anything in our world, it probably compares to like a firework show. Um, but it's pretty cool. Now, the main event of the second seed is second planting on the 7th of the month. Uh, which is a celebration of the second sowing of seeds of the year. People celebrate the improvements in life, symbolized by the improving of the second sowing over the first. And once again, temple healers will heal people's diseases for free on this day, unless it's a wound resulting from combat, as violence is especially frowned upon on this day. Alright, onward to mid-year, or June in our universe, which has on the 23rd as its most interesting minor holiday, Dancing Day, where the population of their whole, well... The people of Daggerfall just dance. That's it. That's all we got. And we've got the mid-year celebration on mid-year 16th, where the people of Tamriel celebrate the halfway point of the year. This celebration is held to basically just distract the people of the Empire from the mid-year tax increases of the Emperor. Uh, it's a day where people visit temples for blessings of the gods, with priests giving discounts on their services and with elaborate festivals held in the city of the Empire. An interesting tidbit is that in the book, which the festival is described, shows how people get far too overconfident due to the blessings of the gods that they get during the festival at a discount. Meaning that it often ends badly for people as they think that they're basically invincible due to the blessings. Now next we also have the Pelennol Mid-Year Massacre, often also called Mid-Year Mayhem in the Elder Scrolls Online. Which is an Elder Scrolls Online holiday celebrating Pelennol White Strike's battles against the Aliots. It goes accompanied with a PvP event in Cyrodiil and the, in the Elder Scrolls Online and it gives in-game rewards and often also has Crown Store microtransactions to go along with it. Um, so yeah. On to July, or as they call it in the Elder Scrolls universe, Sun's Height. On the 10th of Sun's Height you've got the Merchants Festival. All around Tamriel shops offer large discounts with the people of the continent often waiting especially for this day to make their expensive purchases. Of all the festivals to be placed in the Elder Scrolls Online or in the Elder Scrolls Blades, just please do this one. I calculated it once and sometimes you have to pay like 60 or 70 dollars for an Elder Scrolls Online house. Like, that's far too expensive. I mean, even 30 would be far too expensive for a digital house, but yeah, probably not gonna happen. Bethesda would probably like us to forget about this specific holiday. Anyway, there's also Sun's Rest, which is an event on the 20th of Sun's Height, where the shops are all closed and people take time to relax. It's basically one big continental off day and people just tend to relax and just loaf around. Uh, we also have the Fiery Night, which is on the 29th of Sun's Height, which is the hottest day of the year in Hammerfell's desert regions and features dancing and feasting after the sun goes down, so after the temperature gets a bit normal again. Okay, on to Lost Seed, uh, which is August for us. Uh, with the illustrious Harvest End Festival on the 27th of the month, it's a celebration of the harvest, essentially, and of food in general, with farmers bringing the best of their harvest to the cities and the taverns in the cities offering free drinks to all. It's a day where even the poor get to gorge themselves, which usually results in many people overeating on this day. Also, curiously enough, it's the day that Uriel Septim VII got assassinated, so the beginning of the Oblivion Crisis, so the beginning of the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion. Um, that was on Harvest End Festival. Pretty interesting. Other than the Harvest End Festival, there are no real interesting holidays other than some local celebrations and some local hero celebrations and local harvest customs. So therefore we immediately go to Heartfire, which is September in our world, where the highlight of the minor holidays is Children's Day, which is on the Isle of Bethany, which is here, south of Daggerfall, on the 19th of the month. Originally it started as a day to remember children who fell victim to some vampire, but now it's basically a holiday where children are celebrated and get treats. So a very sad holiday got to a very happy one over the years as people basically forgot the tragedy. The only major holiday in this month of Hearthfire is Tales and Tallows on the 3rd of the month, which is basically a day where people believe that spirits will rise and the dead spirits will take over your body at night. Interestingly enough, the Mage Guild around the time of Daggerfall took this holiday and made it a holiday to celebrate necromancy. And they have their prices of the guild stores. Cool. On October or Frostfall, you've got as highlight of the minor holidays the Deirdre Terror 
on Frostfall the Fifth, where Frondar Hunding is honored by the Red Guards of Hammerfell. Again, I cannot pronounce Red Guard words. There's also the Day of Broken Diamonds on the 23rd of Frostfall, where the death of Empress Kintura Septim II in captivity is remembered solemnly about, by the people of Tamriel. Her death was part of the War of the Red Diamond, which was a pretty complicated civil war within the Empire. I made a video on it as well, so look at that in the description if you want to know more. Now, we also have Emperor's Day, which is the birthday of Emperor Uriel Septim VII on the 30th of Frostfall, which in the beginning used to be big celebrations, but eventually it turned to a solemn holiday when the Empire's economy staggered, and then J. Tharn took over the Empire in the Imperial Simulacrum, and it was just no longer a very happy holiday. And then in the fourth era, it's most likely no longer celebrated as the Emperor was assassinated, and eventually the Great War started on this day so yeah it's probably a painful day that the empire wouldn't want to celebrate in the modern era now the major festival of this month is the witches festival frostfall the 13th it's a day where all around tamriel the fears of the unnatural things like ghosts and evil spirits are ridiculed by wearing strange costumes children in costumes get treats and if they ask an adult for that so basically it's halloween as it's in our universe as even pumpkins and hollow jack lanterns are a symbol of this festival this holiday also found its way into the Elder Scrolls Online to sell furniture to the player base and to give XP boosts and items with some events every year. I have very fond memories of this event myself, as the double XP was an incentive for Mr. Christmas, who is the guy who carries me through ESO because I can't play that game competently. Uh, he forced me to grind me to the level that he wanted me to be at in order to wear the correct gear that he had assembled for me. I spent two real days in Cracklorn while just complaining to him about my predicament. So yeah, I don't want to relive that trauma, so let's just get to the next month. So, the second to last month, which is Sun's Dusk, or November for us, it has the minor holiday highlight, the Moon Festival, on the 8th of the month. There really is no big lore on this holiday, basically just a local holiday around Glenumbra Moors where they honor the moon Secunda. I mean, it ain't much, but it really is the most interesting of the minor holidays here. Now, the major holiday on Sun's Dusk is the Warrior Festival on the 20th. It's a holiday celebrated all around Tamriel, and the highlight is that the weapon stores all around the continent drop their prices for just one day. So on this day, many aspiring young warriors usually get their first weapons with what they saved up over the year. This results in cities often being filled with sparring youth on that specific day as everybody gets their first swords and older warriors trying to get some gold by teaching them the way around the sword. It has also often become bloody in many cities with the poor folk being able to afford weapons for once in a year and enacting their revenge for past crime on others, meaning that no warrior's day is complete without the local guard unit having a headache over the investigations of assault on the streets. Alright, last month, almost there, Evening Star, or December. I don't really have any interesting minor holidays this time for you, as there are only some small local things, and we have the Old Life Festival at the end of the month again, which we already talked about at the beginning of the video. But we haven't talked about the holiday of Saturalia on the 25th of the month, which is Tamriel's Christmas, as some people call it. As it's very similar, with trees even being decorated with ornaments and lights. Um, and you know where this leads. Bethesda trying to sell some more decorations in the form of decorated trees in both the Elder Scrolls Online and Elder Scrolls Blades in the form of microtransactions. Anyway, back to the lore. It originally started as a holiday celebrating the Daedric Prince Sanguine as a day of debauchery, drinking and adult activities behind the curtain. But over the centuries it evolved into a day in which gifts are being given on parties to people that one hold dear. It is a sort of introduction to the old and new life festival for many, as from this day forward the people of Tamriel start to prepare for those holidays, so that they may be a good party at the end of the year. That said, we have now talked about the vast majority of Tamriel's holidays, or at least all of the interesting ones. Again, there are more of them, holidays where village X congregates to pray for a good harvest or pregnant goats or whatever, but I didn't really see it all too necessary to talk about them. As there's quite a long list of holidays already and 99% of these haven't been seen in any game since Daggerfall. Since in Daggerfall it was like a game mechanic where local areas had local holidays. So yeah, that just had to do with the local towns that you could visit. So if you really want to know about those, I recommend looking them up online. As this is about all I can tell you about the holidays of Tamriel. That being said, now let's talk about the love and marriage traditions of the races of Tamriel. So, love. 
It's an essential part of life and this also holds true for the humans, elves and beast races of the Elder Scrolls games. There are many deities associated with love and affections in its many forms such as the Aedra, the Bella and even the Daedric Prince Azura. But the deity most associated with love would most definitely be Mara, a goddess that's almost universal, appearing in pretty much every pantheon in Tamriel with very few exceptions. However, at this point some of you will be asking, isn't Debella the divine of love? Well, yeah, but Debella and Mara represent different aspects of love. Debella is about beauty, sex and art, uh, the more carefree love if you will. While Mara on the other hand represents family, stability and fertility. The more responsible kind of love, as many people see it, let's just say. It's not a coincidence then that Mara's designs, fear and even name were heavily inspired by the Virgin Mary from Christianity. I mean, just look at this statue. Marriages under the rites of Mara are by far the most common and widespread across Tamriel, appearing in Altmer, Bosmer, Breton, Imperial and Khajiiti cultures, and it was even present in extinct cultures like the Aelid culture and Snow Elven culture. Just like in the real world medieval times on Tamriel, usually commoners marry for love, but higher members of society such as nobles and kings often partake in political marriages to gain advantages and alliances, such as Potema Septim being married off to the elderly king Menti. Yarko of Solitude when she was just 14, which is kind of messed up to be honest, but I mean history in the real world is full of fucked up marriages as well, I mean just check the Egyptian Ptolemy family tree, but yeah, uh, reasons for marriage might differ between cultures. Now on Tamriel polygamy is uncommon but not unheard of in some cultures and the marriage ceremonies themselves are usually quite simple with either a priest of Mara officiating the wedding as seen in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim or two individuals by their own pledging themselves to each other in the front of a shrine of Mara as seen in the Elder Scrolls Online. Uh, the exchange of special rings made to represent the couple's undying bond is a thing in both instances of the ritual, although the name of that ring differs, but they actually did make a replica of the ring of Mara, of which I got pictures at the courtesy of the viewer the Violet Bunny. So yeah, although to get back to that very short ceremony that we see in the games, that's most likely not all that there is to it. Uh, there's a considerable possibility that this simplicity is more a gameplay thing than a lore thing, uh, after all, most players wouldn't have the patience to get through in-game hours or even days of rites and celebrations, so the developers would have to simplify things for gameplay. Um, this is strengthened by the fact that we have several instances of marriages uh, appearing in lore books, and it's at least suggested there that it takes a bit longer than a few minutes. One more notable thing about Mara's rites is, by the way, that according to their divine teachings, she loves all her children, no matter form, gender or race, and her children may love themselves the same way. Since in Mara's teachings, when two mortals marry, it's their souls which are unified, which do not have gender or race under Mara's teachings. So it's not their bodies that are joined, but their souls, and as such, both interracial and same-sex marriages are allowed under Mara. Although, unsurprisingly, there have been some cases of discrimination by people who do not follow her teachings. But, yeah, now we'll talk about each specific race's traditions regarding love and marriage. And at first we'll cheat a bit, uh, as we'll talk about most of the human races. As the imperial culture has influenced a number of other human cultures around Tamriel, since the empire has basically occupied most of the continent, at least the human provinces, for a large part of its history. The imperial or human version of the marriage rites are the ones that we're most familiar with since we can see it in the game, especially in Skyrim and the Elder Scrolls Online. Uh, the crux of the imperial love tradition would simply be to wear an amulet of Mara and propose to a loved one. Then a short ceremony would be held unifying the couple together. Again, the shortness of it may be more of a gameplay problem than a lore problem, but yeah. These traditions are present at large in Cyrodiil, High Rock and modern day Skyrim. Bretons and Cyrodiilics likely have pretty much the same wedding traditions, although the Bretons may still have some kind of degree of elvish influence, uh, but that's just a guess and not something we know for certain as we do not have any examples of Breton weddings as far as I'm aware. Now, the Imperials, however, do have a specific tradition regarding the Nibbanese people, which is one of the two sections of Imperial culture, you have Nibbanese and you have Colovian. Because in Nibbanese weddings, it's a tradition to give a special wedding pillow embroidered with the family tree of both spouses uh, to give to the wedded couple on the wedding day. That's basically all that we know, so it's 
worth a mention. Now, the Nords of Skyrim are a curious case, since by the time of the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim the marriage rights are heavily imperialized, but the Nords still do put their own touch on it. As Marmal, the priest of Mara in Riften, puts it, Life in Skyrim is short and rough, and Nords have no time for long courtship. Simply wearing the amulet of Mara in public would signal one's availability, and this implies that longer periods of wooing and courtship may be present among Imperials and Bretons, as you know, the quickness of the ceremony may be just a Skyrim thing. Um, however, we do know that a truly traditional Nordic wedding ceremony itself, as implied by Vunwolf Snowshot during the Bound Till Death quest in the Dark Brotherhood questline, would be held in the open air and not in a temple. So in the open air at the mountains under the skies and winds of Kine. Um, shame we don't have the choice to put up such a traditional Nordic marriage, but you know, gameplay limitations, I guess. There's also an ancient term called Warwife among the Nords, but that didn't hold any significance to marriages, it seems, uh, being more used to describe a woman warrior like a shield sister. However, an interesting theory for this is that the word may describe a Nord woman who is married to war itself, so essentially a war maiden. Um, but yeah, that's just a theory. Now, for the Red Guards, we don't have a lot of detail about Red Guard practices regarding marriage. The only thing we know for certain is that it's quite rare to see unions between crowns and forebears, which are the two political factions of Hammerfell, since they hold such different values. Now, other than that, there's just the possibility that the crown specifically have their marriages patroned by Morwa, the Yakutan version of Mara, since the crown are way more traditionalist, while the forebears are more liberal and tend to worship the imperial divine pantheon, so they may marry under Mara. Uh, next up, let's talk about the Argonians. The Argonians have very different marriage traditions to the rest of Tamriel, and even different tribes of Argonians may have different customs. Many believe that the Hist are involved in some matters, deciding and making sure that mates meet and fall in love, even establishing the time of their future marriage for when the couple is prepared for it. In other words, the Hist manipulate even this aspect of the Argonians along with their biology. Now, regardless of his involvement, uh, Argonian tradition dictates that an Argonian presents the person they wish to marry with a special ring with three flawless amethysts in it. The two on the sides represent the couple and the middle one represents the hist. This tradition is likely to come from the Blightroads tribe of, or the Meyer Dancer tribe since they are renowned for their crafts. As for the marriage traditions themselves, well... It's debatable if Argonian weddings can even be considered weddings sometimes. Uh, the Argonians, especially the ones from Merkmire, have bonding rituals instead. You see, with some tribes, the tribe simply chooses who will lay the next clutch of eggs and produce the next generation of Argonians, and then pairings are made among this group of people, most from the same tribe, but bonding rituals are often made between different tribes to establish alliances, not unlike political marriages. Such pairings are made according to a variety of reasons, emotional connection, physical attractiveness, advantages to the tribe, among other selection criteria. Another important thing to note is that the pair has mutual respect and appreciation for each other in this ritual, but they don't necessarily have romantic feelings between them. As this ritual isn't really based on romance, because in the ceremony which is made, which we don't have any details on, as the details may even vary between tribes, is a ceremony in which a tree minder blesses the couple with good health and fertility, and then, well, they mate. The couple retreat to their nuptial huts and then honeymoon time, baby. I mean, okay, jokes aside, this is one of the key elements of the Argonian bonding ritual. The couple has to mate and they have to generate new life. That's the crux of the whole deal. And that's why it's unlike a marriage in other places, because the couple doesn't have to remain together after the deal. Often they just go back to their life as singles after the bonding. The objective here is to increase the tribe's number and not to unite two people for life. A little bit of trivia here is that a letter in Skyrim found in the Temple of Mara from Talon J, one of the innkeepers of the PM Barb, asking the priest of Mara whether he can have a traditional Argonian marriage at the temple with Kivara, you know, the other innkeeper. He even offers to bring books and writings and teach the priest the complicated Argonian language and the praises needed for the ceremony. Um, well. If the priest of Mara accepts that, I mean, good luck trying to pronounce all the gel stuff. I mean, I mean, you can try if you understand gel, uh, which is the language of the Argonians. And I made a video on that a while back, so you can find it in the description if you want to know more about the language of the Argonians. 
chill. As that's the language that the ceremonial aspects of the bonding ritual are all pronounced in. Next up are the Khajiit. Now we know very very little about Khajiiti love traditions and that's really a shame as the Khajiit have a unique and intriguing culture and world view as we many times covered on the channel but we know very little and we must guess, to, guess a lot. Now first and foremost we know that polyamory seems to be rather common among Khajiit compared to the other races. Uh, although it's unknown if this continues after marriage ceremonies in the form of all-out polygamy. Also, we know that the names of Khajiit, or at least their honorifics, change upon marriage, since there are specific honorifics for single lads and ladies, like the J in Jezargo, for, for instance. If he was to marry, he would no longer use the honorific J. Uh, maybe that's why you can't actually marry Jezargo in Skyrim, as they would have to change his name to just Zargo, or Dar Zargo, or, Do or Do Zargo, which are honorifics for clever and warrior Khajiit, respectively. Now, other than that, we know that Mara is their goddess of love, but it's also likely that Azura or Narini, their gods, may have some role in their marriage traditions, giving the importance of them to Khajiiti culture. And maybe the moons even have a role in their marriages, as you know, the moons are even more important in their culture. But it's all just a guess, as we literally know nothing about Khajiiti marriages, other than that they exist, as we do have some examples of, for example, political marriages, and we have some example of Khajiit calling other Khajiit husbands or wives. Well, next up are the Bosmer. To be perfectly honest, we have little to no info on the Bosmer traditions regarding marriage. However, we can witness one marriage in the Elder Scrolls Online between the Sylvanar and the Green Lady, who, to put it very oversimplified, are very important figureheads of Bosmer culture and religion, who are destined to be wed and be together. And we can view their wedding in the Elder Scrolls Online. Now, their wedding does reveal that, at least for such a traditional marriage, Bosmer marry before their god Ifre, although less traditional Bosmer seem to still marry before Mara, as we have examples of that as well, uh, which are likely Bosmer influenced by the Imperial Pantheon. We also know that upon their marriage they hold a large feast to celebrate the union, but, well, they're wood elves, followers of the Green Pact, meaning that they cannot eat anything plant-based gathered from Valenwood, so if you ever attend a Bosmer wedding, don't expect any vegan options. Alright, next up, the Altmer. Now, as we established in the Death and Funeral Traditions video, link to that in the description if you haven't seen it, Altmer are rather obsessed with matters of bloodline and lineage. As such, their marital customs also take on this aspect, often being arranged between families for the purpose of heritage and purity, not out of love. Now, in fact, many couples betrothed in such a way are loveless, seeing their bond as little more than convenience, and the purity aspect is very important too, often seen as the most important part of a relationship, and as such, interracial marriages or even just romantic relationships with, with other races or, you know, just sexual relations with other races involving Altmer are very rare in traditional Altmer circles, although there are a lot of more liberal Altmer. Matchmaking and courtship and the negotiations between the betrothed family may take years or even decades because, well, elves live very long, so their, you know, negotiations also take very long. And once the deal of a marriage is arranged between two families, the Altmer then seek the stars and divines for auspicious omen, basing upon them to decide if the couple is compatible and even establish the date of the ceremony itself. I personally would do this before the, you know, decades of negotiation to see if the couple is even compatible, but you know, tradition I guess. But as such, it's no surprise that on the instance of one or both of the betrothed going back on their word and break the betrothal after it's all fixed, the involved would be seen as outcasts and pariahs. I mean, look at all the work they have to go through to get someone married. I mean, no wonder they get very angry when all the work and effort is just thrown out of the window. But I have to be very clear that these are very traditional Altmer circles, as we do have a lot of examples of Altmer marrying other races, so there's a lot more, you know, liberal ones out there. Now, next up are the Orsimer. You know, Orc marriage traditions are among the most unique out there, and that's saying something. Let's start with the Stronghold Orcs, since they're what we know most about. As per the Code of Malakad, the chief of the stronghold is the only male allowed to marry and father children. Uh, the only way another male, even the chief's sons, can marry is becoming a chief themselves, usually by killing the current chief or, you know, go and found their own stronghold. The orcs value might and strength above all. Only the strongest may have children, so each generation is stronger than the last one. 
But here's the thing, not only is the chief the only one that can marry, but polygamy is also a big deal since the chief can marry a pretty much unlimited number of women, forming a harem, with each spouse then deemed a hearthwife, forgewife, wife, huntwife, shield wife, or any other type of wife with specific duties in the stronghold according to their status. However, there are instances of unofficial in or informal unions between either orcs or strongholds and even procreation among them. But, you know, officially only the chief can marry. Now, the code doesn't recognize such unofficial unions, but there doesn't seem to exist a harsh penalty for it either. Uh, female orcs from a stronghold will often be betrothed to other chiefs as well, which is basically a political marriage. But here's something interesting that you may not know, because, you know... What about female orcs? Well, it's possible, apparently, under the code of Malakat, for a female orc to form her own stronghold and in turn marry as many males as they wish in a basically a reverse harem situation. These males, in this instance, take the traditional roles of wives with the same title. So you have hearth husband, shield husband, etc. Uh, we don't see this in the game, but it is there in the lore, which is interesting. Now, outside of strongholds, there's a very interesting and also kind of hilarious orc engagement or wooing ritual. You see, before wooing a woman, the suitor must fight a great battle because he must smell of battle and the blood of his enemies. And then he presents the desired maiden with agitary cheese and spiced ale, which is rumored to be a sort of aphrodisiac. I mean, see my video on the cheeses of Tamriel for more information on that. And lastly, the suitor then recites a love poem with war, violence, blood or revenge as a background. But at the same time trying to flatter and compliment the maiden in question. She may accept or not accept and I mean, not gonna lie, I would find it absolutely hilarious to watch an orc wooing ritual. I mean, I can only imagine what kind of poems that they come up with, which are both romantic for the maiden but at the same time are drenched in violence. I mean... Sure. As for Trinimac worshipping orcs, or orcs that do not worship Malakath, but rather Trinimac, we don't know much about their traditions. It's said that among them, uh, that if two orcs truly love each other and are married at heart, it's just as valid as any other marriage. Meaning that they don't really use ceremonies at all, as, you know, they can just decide themselves, well, we are married, and if they are truly married at heart, it's recognized before Trinimac. Now finally we've got the Dunmer, so the Dark Elves. The thing about the Dunmer is that we know how their marriages worked before the Fourth Era, but we don't really know how they work nowadays, since the Tribunal isn't necessarily, you know, around anymore after you kill Amalexia, so the seal is killed and the fact disappeared. Uh, regardless, during the Tribunal's rule over Morrowind, marriages would happen at a shrine of Amalexia, sometimes she was called Mother Morrowind. Due to her title and nature as mother, Almalexia would then be regarded as presiding over family, fertility and love. In other words, a kind of Dunmer version of Mara for the ritual. At least that's how it worked for the house Dunmer. The betrothed from the lesser house would then be accepted into the house of the spouse-to-be, which is the higher house, following oaths and loyalty to both their spouse and their clan. This would make them able to interact with the ancestors of the spouse's clan, though their connection would be a bit weaker than someone who would have the actual bloodline. Additionally, they can still retain access to their own ancestors if they wish to visit their tombs, even though they no longer carry their names. Now, political marriages also were relatively common, especially during the Empire's rule, but the Dunmer still have attractiveness and intimate bonds as being important for a marriage. There aren't many, if at all, references to Ashlander marriage traditions, but it's known that sometimes, very rarely, weddings between House Dunmer and Ashlanders would happen, despite their clear belief differences. But again, this would be extremely rare, as for the Ashlanders themselves, we don't know an awful lot. But we do know, however, that wives and brides are rather objectified and are often offered between tribes as singles of alliance and peace. Now, in the fourth era, after the fall of the tribunal, we don't really know how their culture works in that regard, but it would be a fair assumption to say that Azura would likely be their main deity for such matters, since she has connections to love, and I mean, I can't see Mephala and Boethia having ties to marriage. But that's pretty much it for the marriage and love traditions of Tamriel. So now let's talk about something a little bit more sinister. The traditions associated with death, funerals and the afterlife for the races. So first of all we must talk a bit about the god or gods who preside over death in the Elder Scrolls. In the majority of cultures this god would be Arke, god of the cycle of life and death. 
Most cultures will ask for his blessing for the departed loved ones, and such rituals are believed to be important to keep the death safe from the influence of necromancy, a magical art considered to be abhorrent in the eyes of pretty much everyone on Tamriel, although there are some exceptions as you'll see later in this video. After all, who would like to see their loved ones' spirits bound to the mortal world against their will, basically held in pain and taken from the rest of their, you know, respective afterlives? So, the rituals to Arche, or whatever aspect of Arche the different cultures worship, are present in most cultures around Tamriel. Arche's blessing, in some cases indeed, have the power to prevent or hold off necromancy from being exerted upon the dead body, preventing that soul from being used or interacted with without their consent. Arche has the three consecrations that he gives upon mortals, though only the last two really apply for this video. His first consecration is Arche's Grace, which is bestowed upon birth on a being. Uh, it protects the souls of the innocent to keep their free will. Second, we have Arche's Blessing, bestowed upon the dying, which prevents their souls from being used without consent. And we have Arche's Law, which pre prevents the bodies from being raised in unholy rituals post-mortem. That is pretty much everything you need to know about Arche for this video, but if you want to know more, I have a full video on Arche in the description of this video. That said, let's go through each culture's exact views on death and their customs regarding to it. So, first we have the Altmer, or the High Elves. The Altmer are interesting, since they have a different god responsible for death uh, than Arche. They refer Xarxes, the god of history and lore, as the god of the deceased, since he's a scribe who records the lives of all elves. And as scribe, Xarxes records not only the individual lives of all elves, but also their lineages and links to their ancestors, including the Aedra. This, along with the idea that Xarxes was once a mortal elf who ascended to godhood, gets along with the belief of the Altmer that all elves are descendants from the gods, the Aedra, and can even reach apotheosis and return to their godly state as spirits someday. Uh, since nothing matters more for the High Elves than their ancestry and bloodline, Xarxes' role as their major deity of death becomes pretty clear as he records their life uh, for the newer generations as they become ancestors. The Altmer believe that when they die, their spirits directly ascend to Aetherius to join their ancestors. This is seen as a liberation of sorts, since they see mortality as a trickery imposed on them by the betrayer Lorcan to the original spirits and all their descendant generations. They venerate their deceased ones greatly by respecting their passages into the afterlife. For the Altmer, it's very cruel to encourage or force a spirit to linger in this world, and so they find necromancy to be abhorrent and disgusting. Although they consider death to be a liberation for the spirit, they do have special punishments for those who live and or die in dishonor, by erasing any and all of their records out of their records of that person's existence. This makes them not to be considered ancestors any longer and they will vanish from memory, a fate which is considered worse than death itself. As for funerary rites, the Altmer do not bury their death, although the more sentimental and longing ones may erect shrines or little mounds to remember their departed ones by. Instead, they cremate their death and bury their ashes in shrines and mausoleums. Some of the most grandiose mausoleums, held by the families of kings and kinlords, often had successive generations buried there, and the current members of the family would treat the mausoleum as a temple to the ancestors, often going in there in search of guidance. But something interesting with this is that there are also special prison mausoleums dedicated to the souls of criminals or especially despised members of society. For all Muslims go that there are priests dedicated to blessing, warding and guarding such places from any desecration or necromancy, because as I said before, necromancy is considered extremely abhorrent in the eyes of the Altmer, and any necromancer caught, caught in the Sumset Isles can wait probably the worst and most severe forms of punishment. Which makes, for example, Menda Marco, who was an Altmer, probably the most infamous necromancer of Tamrielic history, an interesting case as his taking up necromancy would have meant that he would have never been welcome in the Summers and Isles again. Anyway, next up are the Imperials. The Imperials revere Arche as their god of death, and they were also the ones to come up with the most well-known concept of Arche way back in the first era, when Saint Alessia established the Eight Divines, synchronizing both elven and human elements in her religion in order to appease all of her subjects. Arche, for instance, combines elements from Orke, a human god, and Xarxes, an elven god. 
The Imperials believe that the souls of the death depart to Aetherius after death, to join RK and all the other gods in Aetherius. They believe Aetherius to be the seat of the divine, so the Adran specifically, and the source of all magica, which infuses the daily existence of everything, coming from Mundus via the sun and the stars. Imperial buried traditions are among the most widespread and most practiced on Tamriel, giving their influence in pretty much everything after conquering the whole continent. Imperials bury their dead in graveyards, both inside and outside of the proximity of towns and cities, or in catacombs, a practice most used by the noble and wealthy. Temples of RK hold catacombs of their own, usually reserved for priests or other important people to the community. Priests of RK protect and guard such places against defilement by, for example, necromancers. Pretty much every Imperial is anointed with the three consecrations of RK to protect and bless their souls, and even criminals about to be executed are granted this blessing. We can even witness this at the start of Skyrim, of course, when the priests give us the last rites, well, before, you know, the Stormcloak soldier interrupts them. Necromancy, though, is a bit different than from the Altmer with the Imperials, because in Cyrodiil it's relatively common, despite it being mostly illegal or frowned upon for the general population, at least historically. But it's still less rare than in other places, since historically the Imperial government would sometimes grant corpses to necromancers in the employ of the Imperial government to pursue academic research on the subject. It's not really known if the Mead dynasty kept this practice in the fourth era so necromancy is probably now completely illegal in Cyrodiil or maybe they're still doing it but we know that it happened during the Septim and Riemann and dynasties. Now having talked about the Altmer and the Imperials we will talk about the Argonians. The Argonians believe that their souls come from the Hist given to them by drinking the Hist sap when they are born and then returning to the Hist when they die. The Hist provides them with blood, breath and essence which are the most important to them. So the Argonians don't really treat their death, that is, as corpses which much reverence or anything. Their funerary rites are really simple compared to most of the other races. When an Argonian dies, their body is laid to rest in the marsh, returning to the land and therefore to the Hist. Even Argonians who die away from the Hist, away from Black Marsh even, can still rejoin the Hist by simply having their bones returned to the marshes of the province which actually gives a whole new dimension to the line that Hadvar says at the start of Skyrim if the player chooses to be an Argonian, because he then says, I'm sorry, we'll make sure your remains are returned to Blackmarsh, which is actually in line with Argonian tradition. When the Argonians return their deceased to the Hist, they usually simply bury them or simply lay them on the ground with no cover at all. The deceased, though, does receive a funerary mask made of wood and a survat, which is a grave stake which impales and pins the body to the ground. This serves three purposes. One, it prevents the corpse from floating around when the marsh inevitably floods, since that's what happens in marshes. Two, it prevents the corpse from returning as a bog blight, which is a sort of a zombie, although we don't really know much about bog blights at all. And also, the Sulvat is carved with the story of life of that Argonian. Their tales or feats in war, their childhood stories, names of friends, personality, dreams, anything. The Sulvat tells the story of the deceased Argonian to whomever wishes to read upon it. Until one day, the Sulvat, along with all of the body, is claimed by the swamp. Although, basically, this whole funerary rite can be done anywhere in the swamp, it's not always as random, because the Argonians can also bury their dead just among the roots of a history in organized graveyards in places that held sentimental value to the deceased, or, like I said, simply where they fell down. Argonians also have special priests to deal with death whenever it comes to a tribe. They are called the Grave Singers. When death comes, they sing the departed one's final song while carving their sylvat. So, the stake that is going you know impaled in their body they also serve as historians of sorts reading the stakes of their tribe which is very curious on a culture that sees everything as impermanent and temporary not really giving much importance to the past and the future at least not in the way we see the argonians like the altmer argonians also have punishments for those who dishonor or commit blasphemy against the hist and the saxlil people they do this by denying the deceased the ability to return to the hist by sealing their remains in a special urn and in terms of necromancy well argonians don't really care about necromancy i mean they'd rather not see it happen but usually in the marshes their corpses decay so swiftly that necromancers usually don't even bother trying to go into black marsh to raise corpses 
Now, next up are the Bosmer. The Bosmer do venerate both Arche and Xarxes as gods of death. Though they aren't nearly as important as the deity that they seem to see as their actual god of death of sorts, which is Ifre, the spirit of the now. Their views on death are dictated by the Green Pact, a covenant made with Ifre when the Bosmer were created from what they call the Ooze, according to their mythology. These customs are taught and maintained by the Spinners and the Three Tains, and they show little regard to ancestry and lineage, contrary to the Altmer since Ifra is the spirit of the now. The Bosmer believe that when they die, their souls are reunited with their ancestors and Ifra in Aetherius, provided that they followed the Green Pact faithfully during their lives. The ones who didn't respect the Green Pact are said to return to the Ooze, which is the primordial formlessness before Ifra began telling a story, which they see as a hell-like punishment. Ifra erases the names of these sinners from the history and replaces them with silence. Bosmer are a very holistic race, so to speak, believing that everybody is deserving of a proper burial, either having obeyed the Green Pact or not, family or foe. The Green Pact clause, the meat mandate, requires that the Bosmer fully eat and consume their deceased before the time of three days have passed since their passing, never leaving the corpses to rot. The only thing the Bosmer usually bury for their funerary rites are skeletons, and then they treat basically every dead with the same amount of respect as Ifra will judge them after their passing. Also, since Bosmer architecture revolves around shaping trees to form residences and other structures, they don't really build things uh, for the dead. Uh, also, contrary to the Altmer, they don't build big structures to house their dead. In fact, most of the Bosmer burial grounds are simple groves. In any case, the Bosmer eat the flesh of their deceased and store the bones in ossuaries, which is a special place for the bones of the deceased. There are also some graveyards in Velamud, though they are usually built and used by other races. Other races aren't allowed to have their remains laid in Bosmer ossuaries usually, as they are reserved for Bosmer only. Now, going back to the Green Pact, even apostate wood elves, so ones that didn't follow the Green Pact, are to be properly buried, though their ossuaries must be kept separated from those who actually did follow the Green Pact. So although they think Ifra will judge them after death, they will keep somewhat of a distinction between sinners and non-sinners, so to speak. As for necromancy, it's not super common in Valenwood, since bones alone are just more difficult to raise uh, when they're up in a pile than just intact bodies. Uh, in fact, some Bosmer actually enjoy seeing their ancestors raised as that way, and I quote directly from the game, that way their lazy ancestors are doing finally something constructive for a change, and then specifically the lazy ones in life. And finally, the Bosmer have, or at least used to have, a rather peculiar tradition, which is called the Morning War. When a tribe member, and this was in the early tribe phase, so not the ones that are living in cities right now, uh, but when they were still organizing tribes, and some tribes in modern day Valen would still do this. When a tribe member was slain, the Bosmer of said tribe would raid the neighboring tribes and take hostages. Usually one, but depending on the social standing, power and importance of the deceased, multiple hostages could be required. Such hostages then go through a period of vicious torture and testing, supposedly to test their worthiness. After a time then, they are welcomed into the clan that kidnapped them receiving the deceased position, possessions and family. In other words, completely replacing whomever died. This is actually a really old tradition which dates back all the way to the early first era and even before that, before the Cameron dynasty would found the first era, so even from the Meretic era. But currently right now it's only really done by tribal elves and no longer by those living in the cities. And even then it's a fading tradition with even the tribal elves kinda letting it go. But alright, let's talk about the Khajiit now. The Khajiit follow the precipice of the Riddle Thar, which isn't a god, but more like a concept. The Riddle Thar sets guidelines which all Khajiit must follow, and after death they would be separated between true cats and banned cats, according to how they followed the path which was laid out to them by the Riddle Thar. True cats would be the ones who looked for and followed the right trail incessantly, trying the many different paths laid out by Joan and Jode. Following the right trail the whole of your life though is rough and many Khajiit would grow bored with the chase and eventually turn into band cats as they call it. That's why the Khajiit give a big importance to the many moon priests all around elsewhere who help them stay on the right trail by sharing stories of their ancestors, telling tales of inspiration and sometimes as the book The Trail and Tide states, 
swatting the ones who stray upon their flanks until they return to the paths that the moons weave. When a Khajiit, which is considered to be a true cat, dies, their soul is taken by Kanarthi to Lieswer, which is the sands behind the stars, which is sort of Khajiit sovereign guard slash heaven, to play and pray until the next pounds. It's said that in Lieswer the dunes are made out of pure sugar and the moonlight chorus delights all the cats with their song. Also, it's interesting that it's Kanarthi who guides their souls to the afterlife, either directly to the sands behind the stars or to Azura to be judged. Uh, this is interesting because it parallels some Nord beliefs, but we'll get into that in due time. Band cats, on the other hand, are taken by Namira to the dark behind the world to serve Lord Kash and his frightful heart, essentially becoming Dro Matra or corrupted Khajiit. For more details on Lorkash and his misdeeds, I recommend my video on Khajiiti mythology and creation myths, which Mr. Nerd Dragon also helped on. It's in the description of this video. He really likes the Khajiit. Can you tell? Anyway, another interesting piece of lore is that the Khajiit have their own variant, or so to speak, of Arke's consecrations. A Droma Atra, or a corrupted Khajiit, might try to bend a cat's soul and take it into the dark in a ritual called the Bend Dance, but this can be avoided by the ways of Joan and Jode, as those sort of consecrations are called. As for the burial traditions, the Khajiit usually bury their dead, resting their remains in coffins. The departed usually rest with their most valuable possessions or relics, and it's also very common for families to be buried together in the same place. Such burials are protected, or at least theoretically, by the moon priests. And there's something to consider though, and that's the difference between the burials of the Khajiit from Anaquina and the Khajiit from Palatine. And the Queen of Khajiit mark their graves with a cairn of stones and they don't really do much preparation on the corpse itself for they believe that a desert will help them, preserve them longer. The Palatine Khajiit on the other hand bury their deceased underground marking the spot with a single gravestone. Like the Anaquine cousins they don't really prepare the body for burial though it's for different reasons since the humidity of the jungle of Palatine will rot the corpses faster so there's no really preparation needed. There's also a difference between City Khajiit and Tribal Khajiit on how they will treat their dead. City Khajiit are usually way richer and some of the most rich and noble may, might even build grand tombs and mausoleums, housing generations of dead relatives and their treasure. But regardless of the Anaquine or Palatine origin of a city dwelling Khajiit or even a Tribal Khajiit, a common practice revolves around planting waning lilies on burial sites. So all Khajiit essentially do this, because these waning lilies symbolize the remembrance of those who departed. Now, as for necromancy, pretty much none of the Khajiit are anointed with Arke's consecrations, not only due to the unique Khajiit religion, but also due to their emphasis of soul over body. So after death, they don't really care about the body, which is pretty clear, so they don't really work anything on the body anyway. So Khajiit generally don't really care about a grave being robbed even, which is rather unique among any other race of Tamriel. And as such, necromancy is quite common in elsewhere, as bodies are easily to obtain, and the Khajiit don't really seem to care all that much. Now, the next race that we'll talk about is a race that actually does hate necromancy, which is the Red Guards. The Red Guards believe that their death god is Tuwaka, who is often associated with Arke in more cosmopolitan areas, such as Forbear territory. Though he also has a role similar to Kain or Kanarthi in North and Khajiiti myths, taking the souls of the dead to the afterlife in the far shores, as they call their version of the afterlife. Before the creation of the world, Tuwaka was the god of nobody really cares, which is literally what's stated in the lore, by the way. He was the god of nobody really cares, <laughs> which is pretty hilarious. But he found his purpose after the Yakutan god Tal Papa created the walkabout. Tuwaka then became manager of the Far Shores essentially and the guide of Redguard souls to the Far Shores. In the Far Shores realm there is no hunger or thirst and the Redguard souls can partake in a variety of martial arts doing their enjoyment in combat for eternity. Red guards have a huge, and I mean huge, respect for their dead, in such a way that it's not hard to find resting places for the dead to be more complex and intricate than the abodes for the living, as they try to protect their death against any who would disturb them. Red guards build vast necropolises for their dead, either close by or far from cities and settlements. For nobles, kings, warriors, and even for the commoners, 
this is all the same so they build stuff for everybody although stuff for the commoners is obviously usually smaller than those for the you know nobles as the nobles might build their own gigantic personal tombs while commoners can only afford a small grave or place in one of the city necropolises the Red Guards also seem to be the only one who mummify their dead, as the art of mummification has been practiced since ancient times, since before the Ragada left Yokuda, in fact. As mummification is something that originally came from Yokuda. And it's still done to this day, no matter the social standing of the deceased, everybody is mummified. The criminals, however, are usually left to rot in desecrated grounds in the desert, which are designed specifically to prevent their souls from resting. Though it's possible for their souls to be consecrated if they are later to be proven innocent. The Red Guard equivalent of RK priests are the throne keepers. Uh, they are priests in service of Tuwaka who tend to the necropolises and to the dead. Uh, they are also responsible for embalming and mummifying the deceased. The dead and the rights for the dead are so respected that it's considered blasphemy to strike down a risen undead. As striking down an undead apparently carries a terrible curse according to Red Guard culture. So fighting against necromancy usually proves to be very difficult in Hammerfell with you know nobody being allowed to even strike down the risen undead but even though they can hardly fight it there is nothing more abhorrent to a red guard than necromancy or desecration of the dead uh, to a level of them not even being willing to destroy a powerful undead such as a lich but instead trying to usually seal the lich off under magical seals in some tomb uh, instead of having to put it down However, necromancers and their art must still be dealt with in some sort of organized manner. Therefore, there's a group called the Ashaba, which is a tribe of red guards that takes upon themselves the role of fighting off the undead and keeping the people safe, with the cost of them being considered disgusting and cursed and a pariah, and they're usually being shunned by the rest of the populace. Whenever the dead rise, the Ashaba are called upon by the people, but otherwise they are never seen under a completely good light as everybody just hates them which actually really reminds me of the witchers in the witcher up next are the bretons the bretons are pretty curious since they descend from both the need humans and the Dereni elves which are altmer their faith and customs share and unite aspects of both cultures since they revere arke as their god of death and that they came to Arche in the same way that the Imperials did. So as a combination of Orche and Zarxi. So a combination of a human god and an elven god. Bretons are considered to be one of the most pious and religious peoples of Tamriel. Being very devoted to the divines. They believe that Arche keeps the balance between life and death. And commands the souls of the deceased. And upon death they join with their gods and the ancestors in Aetherius. Uh, see the elven and human influence there. Uh, with the human taken as Imperials. Um, and it doesn't stop there though, since the Dureni, who are High Elves, left their mark on the Old Bretons in other customs as well. Since nothing matters more to a High Elf than their bloodline and ancestry. And the Bretons took from that. They maintained pretty much the same power structures from that time. And kings and nobles would build complex and long intricate family trees to both justify their status as noble and keep their status in High Rock. As such, prestigious ancestors and prestigious bloodlines are often held in very high esteem in High Rock, although not for the same reason as the elves. But you can still see elvish influence there. As for funerary rites, earlier records tell us that cremation was the rule among the Nidic ancestors of the Bretons. And as such, cremating remained to be the most important funerary rite for the Bretons, that is, until the Cyrodiilic Empire added High Rock to its territory, which then started to influence the funerary customs in southern and later all of High Rock. Because by the second era, cremation as a funerary custom was all but abandoned. Now both kings and peasants would bury their dead underground, either in catacombs or in simple graves, a practice more akin to their imperial cousins. Kings and nobles would be buried in crypts and catacombs, but often in places outside the city, akin to the Altmer. Bretons also have a separate treatment for the dishonorable, burying them in separated and isolated spots to be forgotten by both history and their descendants. Commoners on the other hand are usually buried just in graveyards either in the city or out of the city. They're resting in a simple coffin or in an either individual or familial grave or tomb. 
Priests of Arcae often guard these places to prevent necromancy, but even if the vast majority of Bretons receive the three consecrations of Arcae, necromancy usually still is very highly practiced in Hyrule compared to the other provinces due to the amount of corpses who are left in battlefields with no blessings or protections at all. Because these battlefields, they're all the results of the endless squabbles and little wars between Hyrule's nobles and kings who have basically fought, them, fought each other for centuries. Now, next let's talk about the Orsimer or the Orcs. First things first, there are some differences in belief between Orcs that follow Malakath, which is arguably the majority of Orcs, and the few Orcs that still follow Trinamak. First we'll talk about the followers of Malakath. The followers of Malakath believe that upon death they are sent to the Ashen Forge, which is Malakath's fortress in his plane of oblivion. There their souls are becoming immortal and they will enjoy constant food, drink, sex and battle. It's curiously similar to the Nord concept of Sovngarde, especially when you remember that most orc strongholds when feeling old age, uh, those orcs usually go and look for a good death in the wilds. In the Ashen Forge it's said that every orc is a chief and every chief has a thousand wives, remember the constant sex part. And every wife to the chieftain has a thousand slaves that they can tend to. Um, interestingly enough, we don't really know what happens to a female orc when they die. Nothing in the lore tells us what happens to a female orc who dies. Um, maybe they become part of those thousands of wives for every chief. But that seems like a bit of a bummer for the afterlife. Or maybe they themselves just get a thousand husbands. I don't know. In any way... What we do know is that the Arshan Forge is a massive place which is constructed with iron and steel with gigantic towers and bastions stretching across the stars and with huge longhouses around the center of the fortress. This forge is integral to the orcs afterlife for it's said that its coals which burn hotter than the sun are fueled by the orcs adherence to the coat of Malakand. When an orc dies, they must be tempered in the Ashen Forge before joining their brethren in feast and battle. Uh, this process revolves around the forge taking their grudges, melting and forging them into the next generation of orcs, though particularly strong and deep grudges may be forced by Malekat himself into legendary weapons and armor, or Daedric artifacts. Trinamek following orcs on the other hand believe something very different. They believe that they go to Aetherius upon death to rejoin their ancestors. This afterlife also consists of constant warfare in Aetherius and shows of might, but a bigger emphasis is put on being with your late ancestors once more, which kind of goes back to their elvish ancestry. As for orcish funerary rites, cremation is their main practice regarding all of Melat or Trinimac following, their bodies are cremated down to ashes which is then handed to their kin. Ashes of kings, chiefs and other important leaders are then forged into arms and armor in the reflection of Malakath's own practices in the Ashen Forge. The late orcs ashes would then be placed under a cairn out in the open under the sky with the most important orcs such as kings being placed on high mountaintops. The cairn would also hold the departed's weapons and armor and their relatives pay their respects at the cairn. Orcs don't tend to bury their dead at all, but despite their usual ruthlessness and brutality, they do respect other races' burial traditions, going as far as to bury their fallen enemies according to their own rights, meaning that the orcs actually build catacombs and graves for other races after battle. Orc corpses are highly sought after by necromancers due to their sturdy skin and their strong bones, since they decay less quickly. There was a time that, the, that a delegation of the Worm Cult even went to Orsinium to convince the king to let them dispose of the dead. Uh, such ne negotiations never came to fruition though, since the orcs abhor and despise any sort of necromancy. And usually it doesn't really happen to their bodies since they're cremated. Alright, next up are the Nords. The Nords are mo one of the most fleshed out races regarding their death beliefs, and part of it is, is due to the latest main game taking place in Skyrim. I mean, we even go to Sovngarde at the end of the main quest. Speaking of Sovngarde, it's the Nordic afterlife, though it's rather exclusive, because a Nord isn't judged for how they lived, but rather how they died. Nords that prove themselves and die a warrior's death in battle go to Sovngarde upon death. Nords that die peacefully, be it by disease, old age or any similar reason, simply go to Aetherius to join the Aedra. 
In other words, you might be the biggest asshole of all, the evilest and cruelest tyrant that ever roamed the land, but as long as you die in battle, you're completely fine. Unfair? Maybe, but that's how it is. And it's not really like Aetherius is bad or anything. And no matter if you died eviscerated, decapitated or mangled in any way, um, your spirit will still be in peak condition when in Sovngarde. There's even a word wall which reflects this philosophy, which says, Noble Nord, remember these words from the Whorefather. Fear not the spectre of death, for he is the herald of glory and your guide to great Sovngarde. But within Sovngarde there is also the Hall of Valor, which is Shor's palace, reserved for only the greatest Nord heroes of all. Anyone can gain access to it, but they have to face Tsun, the god of trials, in combat and defeat him, which grants them permission to cross over the Whalebone Bridge into the hall itself. One can also be allowed into the hall by getting invited by Shor himself, though that's a very rare instance. In the Hall of Valor there is no pain, no illness, meat is overflowing and food is endless. And the Nord heroes face each other in tests of metal. There are even spectral enemies in the shadows for those who do not want to fight other Nords but still want to fight. In other words, the Hall of Valor is basically one big fight club and drinking club, but better. It's theorized that Shor is gathering all these heroes in his halls to form a mighty army at the end of this iteration of the world and at the start of the next to then use to conquer it or whatever. Uh, but that's just a theory. As for funerary customs, Nords usually bury their departed ones in halls of the dead, which doubles as catacombs and temples for of Arke or Orke back in the earliest eras. Priests of Arke are trained, sometimes since they were children, to perform the fu uh, funeral rites. The Nordic priests of Arke usually live very solitary lives, often seen as outcasts by other parts of the population. These priests have ceremonial daggers as a symbol of office and also an amulet of Arke which works as a source of divine power and helps them hold off the dead if they ever become restless. Smaller settlements would have graveyards or small barrows in place of halls of the dead which is usually only for the cities where they place the corpses and are laid in coffins or they're just buried. And if they're buried they just mark the spot with a gravestone. Sometimes it's needed to wait for the ground to thaw out, giving the harsh climate, but the cold also helps preserve the corpses once they're in the ground. Some bigger Nord clans would often have their own clan barrows, with their descendants taking care of it, and sometimes kings and other important figures would have their own clan barrows, secluded from populated areas. Think for example about Isgrimur's tomb, which we can actually find in Skyrim. Corpses are buried in such barrows that would often be embalmed, although modern Nords no longer seem to embalm their dead judged by Skyrim. A less practiced and uncommon kind of funeral rite though for Nords, uh, although it's not really seen badly, it's just less common, is a fire burial or cremation in a pyre, like what happened to Coat like Whitemane at the end of the Companions questline. And in a very similar vein, a ship burial would also happen in ancient times, which works pretty much the same as ship burials in our real life Viking history. The departed would be laid in a ship filled with loot and kindling, and then flaming arrows would be shot at the departing ship from a distance, laying it ablaze. As for necromancy, we don't really have more in-lore leads or information on the Nord stands, but given the Nordic climate, uh, of preserving the bodies better and the amount of necromancers that we actually find in Skyrim and also the presence of a lot of Draugr and ancient tombs everywhere it would be fair to assume that necromancy is relatively common in Skyrim. Now finally we've come to the Dark Elves or Dunmer, actually one of the most fleshed out cultures given their unique relationship with death. Uh, for starters the Dunmer don't really make a distinction between Mundus, Aetherius and Oblivion Regarding all of them as part of a big whole, with many paths coming and going with no distinct borders. As such, Dark Elves believe that death isn't the end, but the beginning. Considering all this, it's no surprise to know that the Department departed Dunmer spirits most usually persist after death to guide, counsel and protect the descendants. The bond shared between ancestors and living Dunmer is partly blood, partly ritual and partly volitional. For a spirit, if it's not a pleasant experience to linger in a mortal world because it's filled with pain but Dunmer ancestors despite not liking it endure of their own volition to better protect their family and bloodline after dead considering it to be an honor-bound duty so they will linger 
uh, of their free will. Such spirits will always recognize their blood and kindred. However, if an ancestor spirit is displeased or angry with a descendant, they might even attack their own descendants. But curiously, even a stranger can earn their trust and favor if they pay the proper respects at the family shrines. There are cases where a spirit is bound against their will to protect their family shrines. This is most often a punishment for a dishonorable family member. Uh, usually though, those spirits go mad and make for terrifying guardians of shrines. The other spirits, spirits of the faithful, are the ones to restrict and keep those rogue spirits in check. They are prevented from harming their own blood, which does not prevent mischievous behavior towards sand blood, but still prevents them from harming it. But those spirits are particularly dangerous for intruders. Now, there's also the risk of an intruder pertaining the spirit's madness and preying on their resentment of the clan, essentially manipulating the spirit for their own gain. Necromancers usually take advantage of this. As for specific customs, Dunmer are usually cremated upon death, so he might return to the ash from whence they came. Uh, such as philosophy is actually really similar to real world Christianity with the whole thou art dust and to dust thou shall return. Now, remember when I said back then that the Dunmer spirits protect their family tombs? And uh, there is another form of protection called the ghost fence. Sometimes an ancestor, as a sign of honor and sacrifice, may offer part of their remains to power a ghost fence, which is essentially a spiritual barrier protecting the family's tomb and shrine and household. The remains used become also a beacon for the other family spirits. Such arrangements are usually accorded before, recorded beforehand in a will stating that a bone shall be part of a ghost fence with all the solemn respect and ceremony. There are some ways to make a ghost fence more powerful with a bigger quantity of remains for instance. As such there also exist really powerful ghost fences where multiple whole bodies are basically used to power it. And the strength of the person who actually powers it also matters. So if a particularly powerful soul is used to power it, ghost fans will be more powerful. The great ghost fans around Red Mountain at the time of the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind was an example of this, with many House Dunmer offering their remains to power it. Each House Dunmer family has their own shrine, which may vary in size depending on the family's wealth, from simple alcoves to the grand ancestral tombs. Such shrines are called the waiting door and there are the me family members they can pay their respects there, doing oaths and sacrifices, praying or simply telling what's happening currently within the family to the deceased. In exchange the spirit offer guidance, uh, training and blessing for the re living relatives. It's a kind of heartwarming relationship really. Imagine ch chatting with your departed loved ones about the ins and outs of your family as they're actually responding and actually try to help you. As for Ashlanders, they simply bury the cremated remains of their dead and mark the place with a cairn with the possessions of the departed individual. Ashlanders would usually come to such cairns to pay their respects, leaving offerings to the most honored ones. Many see the fact of the Dunmer commuting with the dead in such a way as necromancy, but any dark elf would tell you otherwise, since the spirits remain in the world, usually at least of their own volition. Because actual necromancy is very frowned upon by the Dunmer, although in the Third Era some would practice it upon enslaved races. Some Talvani mages, for example, were rather talented necromancers. And that's basically everything I can say about death, funerals and the afterlife for each of the races of Tamriel. Now let's talk about something else. The music of Tamriel, specifically the musical culture and the musical traditions around Tamriel. And a little bit about the styles of music. Alright, so on Tamriel music is a quite significant presence in basically every culture. In almost all inns and taverns around Tamriel music is played and performed. Performing music, just like in our own universe, comes in all shapes and sizes around Tamriel, from professional bards playing in kingly courts or a tavern, to the sea shanties on the high seas, to drinking songs known by many a tavern regular. There's also many religious songs, with the worship of certain deities going hand in hand with communal songs. There's also power in music in the Elder Scrolls universe, as in the Elder Scrolls universe there is power in sound. Some of the most powerful forms of magic of the Elder Scrolls universe are sound based, and it's therefore not a surprise that some songs actually have magical powers, and in some cases spells are actually cast by performing a song. Now, in terms of instruments, there are certain instruments which basically every culture around St. Tamriel seems to have. Basic instruments like the lute, the simple drums, tambourines, flutes, and this 
thing. I have no idea what it is. I tried Google. I tried asking my friends. If anyone knows what this instrument is, please put it in the comments. But yeah. We know that those instruments are quite prevalent all around Tamriel, but there are some instruments which we only find in certain cultures or only in a couple of cultures. But more on that when we look at the differences between the races and the cultures, because we have some more Tamriel white stuff that we need to talk about, as we also know that basically all the cultures around Tamriel have a version of sheet music. Whether or not these writing styles of sheet music are all the same, we don't know. Although we do know that some older cultures had sheet music, which is very hard to read for modern bards on Tamriel. So it's safe to assume that there's likely some difference between, let's say, High Elf and Argonian sheet music. And yeah, even Argonians have sheet music. I was surprised as well, considering their whole philosophy of impermanence. And many Argonians is aversion to recording stuff like history, but we know that they have sheet music. And talking about the Argonians, let's delve into the musical differences between Tamriel's cultures, starting with the Argonians. Now, the Argonians have a very peculiar musical tradition. For one, music and sound plays a big part in their communication with the histories, the conscious and intelligent trees which are created the Argonians in ancient times and still give direction and shape to their culture. In their communication and worship of these trees, the Argonians in some cases make use of wind chimes, the sound of which the Argonians then interpret, and in some cases they use that sound to determine what the Hist's will is. However, worship of and communication with the Hist is not the only way in which the Argonians employ music in their culture, as they have quite a unique musical repertoire. For one, they have some very interesting instruments which give Argonian music a unique sound. For starters, they are the primary users of a strange type of slide flute. They make use of their own types of conga mire drums. And they are known to make marimba instruments out of teeth of swamp creatures. They also use a lot of primitive bells, which they often hang on their tails to use while performing. And they have by far the coolest unique instrument of all cultures, which only they know how to play. The vossa sattel, or frog pipes in the common tongue. It's a favorite instrument to many Argonians, and it uses a strange pipe system connected to five different swamp frogs, who then are connected to horns. While the player uses small buttons to regulate the sounds by decreasing and increasing the shape and sizes of the frog chambers, which is where the frogs are in. Now, the instrument makes horn sounds combined with rhythmic croaking of frogs, and according to many Argonians, it reminds them of home, and it's one of their favorite instruments. I mean, take a listen to how it sounds. grand. Now, while we only have a few Argonian songs that we ever hear performed in the games, we know that they make use of throat singing often, and they often rhyme while singing. And the timing of their songs is a bit strange, as their songs often seem to have a very peculiar time change in them, with speed changes throughout the songs. And the songs that we can hear remind my friend, who knows a lot more about music than me and who helped me out with this video, he compared the songs of the Argonians to the modern day grunge style of music, as it often talks of negative emotions, however also of interconnection connectedness and connections. They sing of the negative sides of life but also of unity within their culture. It's quite peculiar. Now, next up are the High Elves, or the Altmer. And as expected, their musical tradition is completely different than the Argonians. For one, it's far more refined. No frog sounds in your Altmer songs. Rather, they are Tamriel's primary users of refined instruments. While other cultures do make use of instruments, such as the harp, the theorbo, and the lyre, the Altmer seems to be the primary users of this. And as far as I can tell, they seem to be the only ones, at least in the lore that we know of, to make use of violins and triangles. The Altmer have quite a broad musical repertoire, as music seems to be a favorite pastime of many Altmer in their culture. And well-made songs, especially ancient well-made songs, are very appreciated by traditional Altmer. When possible, they tend to sing in the ancient Altmeri dialects, and especially the nobility and conservative Altmer tend to perform music which is said to have been written on their ancient lost homeland of Altmeris. This music is said to be strange and convoluted, with the sheet music being very difficult to read for modern day Altmer, as it's apparently a far different system for modern day Altmeri sheet music. Now, musicians, especially if you're a good musician, that's a very respectable profession in Altmer society, and there are multiple institutions and guild dedicated to musicians. For example, we have the House of Reveries, which is an institution built of artists of many kinds including many musicians. A uh, link to my video where I cover that institution in depth is in the description of this video if you want to know more. Now, their songs themselves are often about their own history, their religion, also about how shitty humans are. They actually sing quite often about that. 
And they also often sing about their own kings, queens, nobles, noble families and institutions, which may have songs written in their honor or just on their own request. Now, something quite interesting is that in the original lore, High Elves seem to have been one of the very few races which actually constructed and used music boxes to play their most popular melodies. Now, in the newer lore, some other races use them as well, such as the Imperials and the Dunmer. But originally, the High Elves seem to have been the only ones, or at least almost the only ones. Now, in terms of musical style, I'll once more have to refer to my friend who knows far more than me as... I've got as much rhythm as that chair. Sorry about that. Anyway, according to his analysis, based on the very few songs that we have that the Altmer perform, they primarily use the classical ballad style of song. They use verses and choruses in a very storytelling manner, which likely came about as part of their religion, which venerates their ancestors. Now, according to my friend's analysis, they sometimes switch between a more classical style of ballad and a more modern type of ballad. Don't ask me why, because once more... Okay, I'll stop now, but my friend's analysis would make sense as assuming their musical development follows a similar trajectory as that of the ballads in our own world, then it would make sense that they still use a lot of classical ballads as a lot of high elves are still fond of their ancient songs brought from their ancient homeland, which likely use a more classical style. This couples nicely to their religion in which their ancestor god Jeffre is credited with inspiring and making the first great elven ballads and teaching birds to sing, thus being a patron god for musicians. Now, for the Altmer's cousins, the Bosmer or the Wood Elves, we have relatively little information. With a small pool of available song performances, there aren't many stylistic things that we can say about their music. From the few examples that we do have, my friend said it reminded him most of classical hymns, but even that is quite unreliable as we have such a small pool of information. In terms of the content of their songs, they mostly seem to sing about religion, their leaders, and of course about nature and the forest. They credit the god Ifra with the invention of music, having been the one to teach the birds to sing, and considering children with a gift for song to be blessed by Ifra. Their priests to Ifra are called spinners, who are also often seen having instruments with them, likely meaning that Part of Ifra's worshipping involves song, but that's just speculation on my part. That being said, however, the Bosmer also have a few instruments of their own. For one, they are the primary users of castanets, which they use in combination with drums in the rituals. They also seem to be the only one to have nose flutes. Great. And they also seem to be the primary users of shams, which is an instrument I've never even heard about. And they have special hand pans, which they use for religious rituals. And apparently they also have kazoos, although that could be an imperial instrument, as it's primarily found in a place which used to be occupied by the imperials in Valenwood. And finally, they use pan flutes, which I guess is cool. Now there's one final bit that we can say about the Bosmer, because we know that they use a quite fun material for their instruments flutes specifically, as they tend to make flutes out of the hollowed out bones of green pack breakers, so Bosmer who hurt the forests of Valenwood. Isn't that quite interesting? Alright, next up let's talk about the Bretons of High Rock. The Bretons, more or less along expectation, have both elvish and human influences in their musical tradition. For one, in the traditional Breton pantheon, the god Jeffre, just like with the High Elves, is also credited with the invention of music. And just like the High Elves, they often make use of the ballad style of song. Although apparently the Breton ballad seems to be more sped up and less classical and slow than the High Elf ballads, while retaining part of the original Elvish style. According to my friend, who actually knows this kind of stuff, it often reminds him of so-called folk ballads. Another apparent difference with the High Elves is that while the High Elves often sing about religion, ancestors and leaders, the Bretons often have less specific hero worship and more celebrate collective battle victories and factions rather than individuals. These ballads come in all forms, from happy and upbeat to melancholic. And finally, they also seem to have a few shanties and lament style songs, and the druid factions of High Rock also seem to have their own musical tradition. In terms of cultural significance, just like with some of the other races of Tamriel, music can be religious with the Bretons, but it's also often performed at mass gatherings such as holidays and nightly tournaments. Some nightly tournaments even have their own song prepared about them to be performed at the tournament. And while they perform these songs, Breton bars often make use of traditional instruments like the lute, the lyre and the flute. But they also have a few instruments that are unique to their own culture, such as the key harp, which is a strange string instrument, which I assumed was unique to the Elder Scrolls universe, but apparently isn't. It actually exists. Cool. Now, from what we know, they are also the primary users of grand organs, and they are one of the only users on Tamriel of bagpipes, along with the Dunmer or the Dark Elves. Now, in terms of the Dark Elves, just like the other races, 
They also have a musical tradition of their own. Those worshipping the tribunal seem to associate Vivek, the living warrior poet god, most with music and musical performance, while others who do not worship the tribunal likely associate Shiogorath with music, as there are some classic stories of him inventing music. And since Shiogorath is present in Dunmer religion, I would think it's likely that they associate him with it, if they don't worship the tribunal. But that's just speculation, as the text crediting Shiogorath from music isn't directly linked to the Dunmer. So, yeah. Just my speculation. Additionally, House Dagoth, before its fall, seems to have had a great musical tradition of its own, but we don't really know too much about that. Now, in terms of instruments, the Dunmer, along with the Bretons, seem to be the primary users of bagpipes, and the only users that we are aware of of kalimbas. We also know that they have an unnamed instrument, which is, uh, let's say, quite interesting. It's an instrument made out of the antennas of little critter scribs that is mounted on a small wooden frame. You then put that in your mouth and plug the antennas of these bugs like strings, with your mouth acting as the instrument's sound box. Sounds absolutely delightful. Now, in terms of musical style, the Dark Elves seem to be a bit all over the place. Sometimes they use classical ballad styles, and sometimes folk ballad styles, and sometimes the lament style. And they often have dissonance between the melody of the song and the chords of the song. And they often seem to vary in tempo throughout the songs. But generally, it seems to be a bit faster than High Elf music and a bit slower than Breton music. Now, in terms of what they sing about, a large section of Dunmer music seems to be about death, betrayal and violence. But they also have some more philosophic songs, and funnily enough, songs about animals, which you'd expect the Bosmer to have, but the Dark Elves seem to have more of. Although, the animals in Dark Elf songs are often used as allegories for people in songs with an aim to teach people, mostly children, life lessons. Now, next up is another race that we know relatively little about, the Orcs. As far as I'm aware, we have no actual song performances from orcs, so we can't really say anything about their style. And we only have a handful of song texts, which doesn't really give us a good indication of what orcs would usually sing about, as the few songs that we do have from them are strangely predominantly love songs, which then are expected very violent in their lyrics along with orcish culture. Now, having such a small pool of songs means that we can't really make any conclusions on the type of songs that they usually have as love songs instinctively seems a bit of an outlier. Although there is some evidence in item descriptions that orcs may have a lot of war chants and marching music, which then seems a bit more in character again. But having just some item descriptions is also not the bestest of evidence. The only thing that I'm confident in saying is that most likely their songs do have relatively violent lyrics in all their genres that they sing in, because that's in line with their culture, and we have evidence of their love songs being so violent. Now, something that we do have a little more information on for the orcs is their instruments. For one, they seem to use a lot of horn instruments. Ironically, they also seemingly use harps, just like the High Elves. Though I have to imagine them being a bit different from High Elf harps, most likely. And they also have a very interesting instrument that I wasn't able to find much of a real-life comparison to, which is called the Golk Leaf, which is an instrument with a single glass fiber string over which several bows, like a violin bow, are drawn to make sounds. It's basically a reverse violin. Instead of one bow string going over several violin strings, you have several different bow strings going over one gold leaf string. Interesting. And along with the Imperials, they also use squeeze boxes, which are basically accordions. Pretty fun stuff. Talking about the Imperials, the accordion seems to have been invented by them and then exported to the Orcs. And as I said before, Imperials may have used kazoos, and they seem to be the primary users of the Kornu, which is a large circular blow instrument made out of metal. In our own universe, they were mostly used by the ancient Roman legions, it seems, so it seems fitting for the Imperials to use them as well. But considering the Imperials are by far the most cosmopolitan culture, we can also see them use instruments of the other races from time to time, which are then important to the Heartland. That being said, the Imperials have quite the musical tradition of their own. Their goddess of music is the Bella, and they are the only race that we know of to have actual opera houses in the lore. And from Oblivion, we also know that the Imperial City Arena, next to being used for blood sport, is sometimes also used for concerts, which is pretty neat. And the Empire has also sanctioned several different musicians' guilds within the Empire, some even dedicated to a single instrument or a family of instruments, like blow instruments. 
In terms of musical style, they seem to be close to the Bretons in terms of speed, and they don't quite have dissonance in most of their music like the Dunmer. Although they do sometimes use it. They sometimes seem to be closer to the Altmer musical style, but then in other songs closer to the Nords. So their musical style is completely all over the place, which is kind of to be expected of a culture who is the most cosmopolitan of all the other races and imports a lot of instruments, customs and musical traditions of other cultures into their own culture, as they have often ruled large parts of the continent. Now, in terms of the content of their songs, that's also all over the place. They have marching songs like the Orcs, propaganda songs about individuals, mostly emperors and important generals, like the Altmer. They have historical songs like the Bretons, and religious songs like basically all the other races. So basically, just like with musical styles and instruments, they are just all over the place and have borrowed a lot from others. Next up, let's talk about the Red Guards. They are very similar to the Orcs in that we have just too little information about them to say anything about their musical style. However, we do know a bit about the content of their songs. For one, they often seem to sing about war, about conquest and about their ancient Jokudan past with the great conquest of Hammerfell in the first era being a prime subject for song. And songs from ancient Jokuda that survived up until the present day are actually being held in quite high regard in Red Guard society. Even though some songs are now unplayable, as the Yukuns used very peculiar instruments like Yukun flutes, which clearly look like flutes, but the way they should be played has been lost to history, as no Red Guard alive knows how they should be played, which is quite interesting. We also know that the Red Guard seem to be the primary users of Punji flutes, sometimes used by snake charmers, and they use tambours, which is a technology that they apparently brought with them from Yakuda. And they seem to be the primary users of the zither which is also a real life instrument that I'd never even heard of, so good job Elder Scrolls for educating a barbarian like myself. That being said, that's basically all we know about the Red Guards, other than that we have some documented sea shanties of their sailors, but that's about it, unfortunately. Alrighty then, let's talk about the two cultures that we haven't covered yet, the Khajiit and the Nords, starting with the Khajiit. The Khajiit clearly have Eastern and Arabic influences in their music. In terms of their musical styles, they often employ the hymn style of music and they emphasize the R sound in their music. Generally, they use far lower tones of voice than the other races while singing, with the exception of the Argonians who go very, very low. Sometimes they will employ the dissonance in their music, which we talked about previously with, for example, the Dunmer. And what's interesting is they often employ a completely different musical skill than the other races of Tamriel, because the other races of Tamriel use the real-life western skill for music, which uses 12 notes. The Khajiit instead seem to use a musical skill more reminiscent of the real-life Arabic skill, which uses 7 notes. In terms of the content of their songs, they often sing about their own culture, their history, their myths and their religion. And that religion part is actually quite logical, because their goddess Kanarthi, which is also the goddess credited by them with giving music to the world, is partly worshipped by performing music. While they do have some light-hearted folk songs, even those seem to have a more professional and coherent composition than most of the folk songs of other cultures. Now, my music friend listened to all the song performances that we have, and he said that in terms of musical style, the Khajiit seem to be most consistent and mostly uniquely designed by the Elder Scrolls developers. Which is pretty cool, and definitely also goes for the rest of their musical tradition. Because for one, maybe except for the Argonians, the Khajiit definitely have the most unique array of instruments, because they have a couple of instruments that almost no other race uses. For one, they have the Khajiiti Kwanun, which in the real world is an Arabic string instrument played while sitting down and plucking the strings of the instrument. They also use the Ezrash, or Ezrai, I don't know how to pronounce it, which is an instrument based on the real-life Indian string instrument, which no other race on Tamriel seems to use, and in my opinion sounds pretty sick. I mean, listen to this. Now, they also seem to be the primary users of the Gezeng, which is based on a real-life Chinese instrument. Now, in my opinion, their culture, at least in terms of music, is by far the most interesting one, well, at least rivaling the Argonians. I mean, come on, the Vossa Sattel is the best instrument from this entire video. It has living frogs in it. Alright, now that brings us to the final culture that we will talk about in this video, the Nords. The Nords, quite unsurprisingly, have quite a storied musical history, as Nordic bards, or rather skalds as they are called, are often revered in their culture, and in a way they are the ones who sometimes are the only ones crediting with keeping Nordic history and culture alive, as they sometimes simply are the only ones to record certain events in history when others just won't do it. 
One of the coolest things about Nordic musical tradition is the so-called Poetic Edda, an immensely long song which documents the history of the Nords in song form. The great skalds of Nordic history have been adding to it for years, ever since the establishment of their culture in Skyrim. This massive song, based on the real-life Poetic Edda that we have of some parts of old Viking culture, is immense, spanning thousands of years of skalds adding parts to the song, with some parts inevitably lost to the histories. And in Skyrim, during the Bard's College questline, we actually try to retrieve a part of it. And there we also learn that the Poetic Edda is often referred to as Skyrim's living history, which is just super cool to me. I mean, some parts of this song are just straight up lost, some of them are known, some of them we don't really know in what you know order they are but we do know that everything in this song is part of nordic history and it's added to by skalds of many many generations that being said in terms of musical style the nords are surprisingly similar to the altmer or high elves didn't expect that did you well neither did i they often seem to employ the ballad style and sometimes more melancholic style of music although their words are often less high class, so to say, uh, than the Altmer, as their songs are often subject to quite stereotypical Viking subjects, you know, fighting, drinking, the old gods of the Nordic pantheon, drinking songs where someone is made fun of, and just exaggerated legends and glory, that kind of thing. One of the things to highlight from that is definitely their referrals to the ancient Nordic pantheon, as even modern Nords who have grown up with the Nine Divines still often seem to sing about their classical pantheon with gods such as Kain and Shore, so that's quite interesting. In terms of musical instruments, the Nords are actually quite boring, with them not really having any unique instruments, save for one pretty cool thing, and that is that the ancient Admorans, before coming to Skyrim, brought a technique of making flutes and musical horns out of mammoth ivory with them, which would then be richly decorated on the outside. Pretty cool stuff. Now, other than that, they have pretty cool traditions of crafting miniature harps out of ice wraith parts, although we have no examples of those actually being used, which is a bit of a bummer, as it's just in an item description. Alright, that's basically everything I could find about the music on Tamriel. Now, let's talk about something else. The martial arts on Tamriel, specifically the unarmed ones. Alright, so while every citizen of Tamriel knows that making a fist and then hitting your opponent with it hurts them, uh, we are interested here in this video in specific schools of fighting or martial arts, which implement unarmed hand-to-hand -hand fighting like judo and karate in our own world. Now, it may come to no surprise that the Khajiit are the most developed culture in the lore when it comes to unarmed martial arts. They have claws, which they regularly use in combat, which often give unarmed combat bonuses. So, it comes to no surprise that Bethesda has developed the Khajiit far more when it comes to the lore of unarmed martial arts. As the Khajiit have several different styles of unarmed combat or claw dances, but that being said, there is criminally little lore on the other cultures in that regard. But I definitely found some info on the other races after digging very deep into some dialogue and lore books. So let's tackle those first and then talk about the main part which will be the Khajiit. Now, first of all, there's a Red Guard school of unarmed fighting, or a martial arts school if you will, which is called the Cycle of Blood. It's a fighting style which makes use of a long setup during the fight. Apparently, the one utilizing the cycle of blood fights in such a way that they slowly build up to a situation where their opponent makes a mistake and then is then essentially trapped, making it so that they can finish their opponent with three quick strikes. It's a complicated way of fighting, presumably requiring a lot of skill and experience in order to pull off correctly. Uh, other than that, we don't really know anything about the cycle of blood, we don't even know what three moves those ending moves are or how they trap their opponent, but that's everything we know about the Red Guard School of Fighting or Martial Arts. But the cycle of blood for the Red Guards is not the only school of unarmed fighting present in the lore. We also have the so-called Way of the Exposed Palm, which is practiced in Cyrodiil, so presumably is Imperial in its origin. Uh, we don't really know which culture produced the Way of the Exposed Palm. But this school of fighting relies on, instead of using your fist, opening your hand and thus exposing the palm and then hitting your opponent with the side of the hand or even individual fingers, delivering precise and pointed strikes with as much force behind them as a fist strike. The way of the exposed palm thus makes use of the physics principle that the pressure acting on an object, in this case your opponent, depends on the force that is applied, divided by the size of the area that the force is applied to on the body. By using the side of the hand or even a single finger, you make the area that you hit smaller, but if you keep the force the same as you would when using your fist, the pressure that the opponent is confronted with will be big, bigger and thus more effective. 
Now, this school of fighting relies on extreme precision, concentration, speed and control of one's movements. Masters in this way of fighting are said to be able to just use their pinky finger to deliver devastating blows to their opponents. Pretty cool, but also pretty weird. Now, we also know that the Nords apparently have a martial school of unarmed fighting, which is centered around being able to block the strikes of the opponents that are coming in, but we don't have a name for that school of fighting, nor do we know much about it, other than that it's centered around blocking, just how we know nothing about Akaviri martial arts, because we know that the Akaviri have schools of unarmed martial fighting, grouped as Akaviri martial arts, but that's really all we know, just a single mention of it without any further explanation. The only additional thing that we know about the Akaviri martial arts is that they are apparently based upon dodging of your opponent's strikes instead of blocking their strikes, so it's different from the Nords in that way, but we don't know anything in terms of movesets. Now, we also know that Cyrodiil's Order of the Ancestor Moths, or the Order of Moth Priests, actually have their own martial arts school, called the Way of the Peaceful Fist, which likely involves knocking someone out without doing too much damage to them physically, going off the name. Uh, because we unfortunately don't know much about this martial arts school, other than that the Order of the Ancestor Moth teaches it to young initiates of the Order, so that they can defend the old and blind priests from threat. Which is pretty cool, because obviously these old priests are defenseless when they're blind after reading many Elder Scrolls. And that's basically it. That's all the lore that we have on the unarmed schoolers of fighting that are not originating from the Khajiit. Everything else in this video will be centered around the Khajiit, who have a whole range of unarmed martial arts. And with good reason, as they have their claws, which can substitute for their weapons in many cases. Now... Therefore, instead of calling them schools of fighting or martial arts, the Khajiit call their martial arts claw dances, and there are several different types or schools of claw dances which have been developed over the years. Each of the types of Khajiit claw dances has their own following, with entire monasteries and orders of priests dedicated to preserving them and teaching them. The funny thing is that most priests in these temples and monasteries do not practice these martial arts or claw dances as a literal martial art, meant for fighting, but rather as a form of meditation in motion, with most claw dances having set patterns of moves, which can be repeated to serve as a way of meditating in motion. In fact, the claw dances themselves originated with the monks in these monasteries, who in ancient times sought for ways to fight back against the ancient Khajiiti warlord, the tyrant Tekans in the Striped Death, who attacked the temples, exiling the monks of ancient elsewhere. He drove the monks from the cities, and after almost a century in which the monks in exile had continually practiced their motion of meditation and perfected them into fighting styles or claw dances, they returned to the cities and towns of elsewhere. They then taught their motion meditation ways, now developed into martial arts, to the people of elsewhere, so that the people could fight back against the tyrant and the other oppressors in elsewhere at the time. Their claw dances inspired massive peasant uprisings, peasants who now had effective ways to fight back against their oppressors. Now, these peasants and monks and their descendants over the years never forgot the power that they could wield with the claw dances, which freed them from their oppressors in the past, and thus, the claw dances were passed on from generation to generation into modern day elsewhere. Now, from the lore we learn of the existence of four types of claw dances which have survived from the ancient times. First is the Way of the Whispering Claw, then we have Gout Fang, we have Desert Wind and Desert Rain. Now, we know that all employ a great amount of discipline in the users, and the use of the claws of the Khajiit to a degree in their fighting styles, so not only weapons, with some combining weapons into the claw dances, and some using no weapons in the claw dances. Now, let's begin with Whispering Claw, or Ziskura in the language of the Khajiit. A uh, video on that language, is in, by the way, is in the description of the video if you want to know more about the language of the Khajiit. Now, Whispering Claw is a fighting style of fast and silent movement. It requires fast reflexes and a good balance and control of one's body, as it employs advanced jumps and acrobatics in its fighting style. It's ideal for killing and can be used effectively in silence while sneaking around, meaning that this specific fighting style is often chosen by assassins. The Whispering Claw style is the polar opposite of the second style, Goutfang or Vrintak in the Khajiiti language. While it's also fast paced like the Whispering Claw, it relies on the strength of the wielder instead of speed and silence. Goutfang includes kicking, punching, grappling and in some cases can be effectively complemented by weapon use, although only masters can effectively combine the unarmed side of the fighting style with weapon use without getting sloppy in their style. Since effective use of Goutfang requires proper coordination of one's body and proper concentration. 
It is a claw dance which is very much based on instinct and interpreting the flow of energy in the body as it doesn't have set patterns of sets of moves which belong together, meaning that it relies largely on the moments and on improvisation since it has no fixed set of moves. It also means that to become a true Gautfang master just a study of moves and move patterns isn't enough. Rather one needs to master their own body and the energy flows within themselves to call themselves a true master of Gautfang and to know which moves when to use. Now finally we have the styles of the Desert Wind and Desert Rain uh, left in terms of Kajidi Claw Dances. These are both only half unarmed as both heavily integrate weapons into their fighting style. While both use the claws, they can only be used effectively in combination with weapons for these two fighting styles. In fact, Desert Rain almost exclusively uses swords, with the only exception being Agile Kicks being integrated into the fighting style. Desert Wind, while also using weapons, apparently uses the paw claws of the Khajiit to a far larger degree, integrating them seamlessly with weapon use. I have to admit, we don't know much about either, except for the names and their degree of weapon use in complement with the claws and feet, but the exact moves of these styles are unknown or what their movers, move sets rely on. Now one final thing that we know is that by the third era, around the time of Morrowind, those who dispute the teachings of the tribunal, the dissident priests, have their own styles of unarmed fighting for personal defense. Apparently developing their own unarmed fighting styles called Golden Reed, Saltris and Marshmallow, which they strangely decided to name after some of Morrowind's most common foods. Uh, the reason why I group these with the Khajiit fighting styles is because the dissident priests developed these fighting styles out of the existing Khajiiti fighting styles as the priests copied the movements of the Khajiit. Now, just like the Desert Wind and Desert Raiden style, we have no idea what types of moves these fighting styles employ or what they rely on. But considering that they are described as unarmed styles, we can assume that they are based on the Whispering Claw and Gautfang style, as these both largely do not employ weapon use and rely on the claws and limbs of the Khajiit. That being said, that's basically all I can say about the martial arts on Tamriel. That's just literally all the lore that we have, other than one little piece of lore that at some point someone developed a fighting style specifically to combat vampires, which employs some moves which are unarmed, but I don't know whether or not that really counts for this video since it also apparently uses bows and spears, so I'm not sure. Anyway, that's about all I could find about the martial arts of Tamriel. Now let's talk about something a bit more tasty. The cuisines around Tamriel and some of the food traditions. I took most of this out of the official Elder Scrolls cookbook since that's our primary source. Um, so yeah, let's talk about it. Before we got this book, I was basically only able to guess on the cuisines and piecing them together using item placement and other items in game wasn't just very accurate since in lore things are mostly different most of the time. But now we have descriptions of each race's cuisines and well it's officially licensed material by Bethesda so I accept it as canon and we will see what I have learned. Let's start with my favorite race the Imperials. Uh, the Imperial Cuisine is made out of some of the best ingredients found all around of Tamriel. According to the book, the Imperials approach cooking in the same way they approach the rest of life, in a straightforward and proud manner. As traders and diplomats, the Imperials collect their ingredients from all over Tamriel, resulting in a cuisine that incorporates a huge variety of meats, vegetables and spices from all over Tamriel. One of the most interesting imperial dishes from the book is, in my opinion, the special imperial seasoning, which is seasoning carried, over, carried by the cooks of the Imperial Legion, to use when cooking meats or fish for the troops. In the, in the universe itself, so not in our universe, because the recipes are different in the book than how they are in lore, logically, because in lore there are certain ingredients we don't have in real life. but. In the universe it consists out of bright citrus, savory and coriander. Another interesting imperial dish is the great imperial mushroom sauce. Once a simple country food which was picked up by the legion and is now even served to the generals themselves as it became pretty popular. And one of its ingredients is, you guessed it, the imperial seasoning. Next up are the Nords whose cuisine we pretty much already knew because there's a lot of it in Skyrim. It's simple and sometimes a bit primitive, it reflects Skyrim's harsh climate. Due to Skyrim's climate, not all of the province is fit for farming, and thus large parts of the Nordic cuisine is made up of meats that are locally hunted and fish that are locally caught. 
The most extravagant Nordic meals are, according to the book, served at feasts and consist out of mammoth roast, horker meat and other meat from large wild animals. Their desserts and drinks are relatively light, made with the fruits that they can grow in the harsh Skyrim climate, like juniper and snowberries. Due to Skyrim, we already know a large part of the Nordic cuisine. And most of it that's basically appeared in Skyrim is mentioned in the book itself. But I want to give a special mention to the meat with juniper berry, which appears in the book. And I simply love that they put it in because I like the reference and I really like collecting the meat with juniper berry bottles in the game. So leave me be. This was basically one of my favorite parts of reading that book. Now, next are the Red Guards. The Red Guards we still know relatively little about, even though the book spends about 30% of a page to tell us. They only tell us that they grow drought hardy crops and raise simple livestock like goats in the habitable parts of Hammerfell. Due to the arid Alakir desert, growing crops and getting food for red guards isn't as easy as for the other races and most of their regular foods get imported from other parts of the, around Tamriel. That said, they do have a rich export sector for spices and hot peppers, which they export to the rest of Tamriel. However, the book does not tell us what the red guards exactly eat. They only mention that they eat flat breads that they bake on stones instead of ovens because the stones get warm in the heat of the Alakir desert and that they make hearty stews out of the things that they can get through farming. But they don't really specify what the ingredients are. Also Redguard dishes don't seem to be featured anywhere in the book unfortunately but it seems to be that it's only almost the only race together with the Altmer unfortunately that do not get a mention in one of the dishes. I might have missed any of them, and if I find any one of them later on, I will add it to the top comment in this video. Now, next are the Bosmer. They are an interesting case to say at the least, since they have a pact with the god Ifrin, the Green Pact. This pact entails that they cannot eat or harm living plants from their homeland of Valenwood. This has resulted in the Bosmer of Valenwood eating almost exclusively meat, which they receive from hunting animals in the Valenwood jungle. They also forage eggs from treetops to then later cook. Most of their food is not really prepared in a special way like the other races. It's cooked, then eaten. Simple as that. They only really prepare big meals for guests and they just hunt and forage the raw materials to cook for themselves and then eat it in a simple manner. While the book does not contain a lot of Bosmer dishes, it does contain a few and there was one that I found particularly interesting. The Bosmer Bites. These are small fruit slices with cheese and hold together by strips of meat. Usually a type of ham, but the Bosmer use for this dish any kind of meat that they can find. The interesting thing about this is the fruit that's inside it, because according to the lore description of this dish, uh, the, these are made using fruits that naturally fell from trees. The fruits inside have also been completely emptied from all seeds, because the seeds must have been replanted, otherwise the forest will get angry. So. To get, eat this little bit of fruit, the Bosmer need to put in a lot of effort. <laughs> now, next we arrive at the Khajiit, the creatures that just love their sugar. Their cuisine contains a lot of sweet dishes cooked with moon sugar over campfires that the Khajiit set up during their travels. Almost every Khajiit cook knows of the black market and visits it regularly to get moon sugar to cook with when another Khajiit comes over for dinner. Due to the abundance of moon sugar in their culture, uh, they have created a sort of tolerance for it, unrivaled by the other races. While moon sugar may be deadly for many other races when taken into large amounts, many Khajiit could not care less about the moon sugar in their food and they just find it tasty. Their dishes often include other exotic ingredients next to the moon sugar that they grow in elsewhere. Unfortunately, their daily cuisine does not have much ingredients from outside of elsewhere since these days many merchants basically avoid the markets of elsewhere due to the illegal moon sugar trade there. Which has made it so that foreign ingredients are hard to come by in elsewhere. My favorite Khajiit dish from the book is by far the skooma. I mean, you did not think that skooma would not be in this book. <laughs> And I promise I'm soon gonna make some skooma live on video and then later drink it, as long as nobody reports me to the guard, of course. Another fun dish was the spiced warm milk with sugar and honey. It's milk, tasty for cats, mixed with moon sugar, tasty for Khajiit, and they apparently take it before bed to get to sleep. It's just warm milk with moon sugar, I like it. Now. The Altmer cuisine is pretty much the way that we all imagined it to be, fine and very perfected. 
In their long years of isolation on the Somerset Isles, the Altmer have perfected their cuisine without outside influences. In recent years, however, they have begun incorporating the finest techniques they learned from all around Tamriel from the other races into their own cuisine, making those techniques even more exquisite and making their cuisine overall even more perfect. They dine with very strict table manners and enjoy a wide range of dishes, as long as it's made from quality ingredients and they can have a fine liquor or brandy on the side. Unfortunately, like I mentioned before, the book does not really seem to feature any Altmer recipes like the Redguards, probably because I'm too much of a weeb to make them since they are apparently so fine, but I'll keep an eye out for them and you keep an eye out for the top comment under this video. Maybe I found anything by the time that you're watching it. I don't know. Next is the opposite of the Altmer, the Orcs. The Orcish cuisine has always been a bit of a mystery to me. To my knowledge there wasn't much on it, but I never imagined it to be very fine or delicate. And the book basically confirms my suspicion. Because the Orcs have a very simple cuisine that is practical first and foremost. Their dishes are simple and a bit primitive. Some Orcs even use the fires of a blacksmith forge to make their food, but they make the food in large quantities in the strongholds. So meals that way can be shared with every member of the stronghold during dinner. The book even gives an example of such a share meal, the Orsimer venison. A communal meal made out of roast venison on rice. Many of their strongholds serve this as venison is most abundant in their strongholds due to the abundance of it. It's simple but tasty. An interesting side note to this is that the best chef in all of Tamriel, praised by even the Altmer, is the gourmet, who ironically is an orc. If you want to know more about him, I did a video about him as well, so watch it if you want to know more. Next up are the Bretons. Their cuisine is also made up of quality ingredients, as they have an access to exotic foods from their rich training in Iliac Bay. And the climate of High Rock is ideal for most vegetables. But what the book also tells us is that Breton cuisine on itself does not really exist, as there are basically two types of Breton cuisine. The noble cuisine, which is expensive and elaborate, it consists out of really fine dishes made for the aristocracy, made by professional cooks, while the poor peasantry of High Rock have their own peasant cuisine, which consists mainly out of their own foraging and farming. As for them, imported goods are likely too expensive, as they're all bought up by the aristocracy. A good example, and maybe even the only example of Breton cuisine in the book, as I haven't been able to find anything else, is the Canis Root Tea, made for Breton mages, that wakes up the body and the mind. Now, next up is probably the race with the weirdest cuisine, the Argonians. Uh, the book even mentions that their cuisine is an impenetrable taste for outsiders. They, they eat a lot of raw fish and forest swamp plants that they collect in the marshes. Their dishes are often accompanied by small side dishes in the form of everything that they can find, from small fish to insects and even other little creatures they find in the marshes. They basically eat everything. Most of their dishes are not made for the other races, however the book does mention the swamp shrimp boil. It's simple, a boil made out of shrimp caught in black marsh. This is one of the few Argonian dishes that has popularity all around Tamriel and has local varieties with local types of shrimps. So, in Skyrim, shrimp caught in Skyrim. Finally, there's the Dunmer. Due to the volcanic land of Morrowind, farming and hunting is very hard for many around the country. Their cuisine reflects this, as they often eat eggs that are foraged and meat from guar. Guar are one of the few animals able to thrive in volcanic landscape. They also have their own crops that grow in the volcanic land, like ash jam. They also have exotic drinks made out of the fruits that they grow in the volcanic wasteland, like chujama. My two favorite Dunmer dishes from this book are not necessarily because of the taste, but because of the lore descriptions behind the dish that go with the page. The first is the Balmora cabbage biscuits, and the second is the Kwama egg quiche. Both are dishes that were only found in Morrowind until the Red Mountain erupted. Then both dishes were carried by Dunmer refugees all over Tamriel, popularizing them and creating local variants with local ingredients. Now, this was far from everything in the book. Uh, this book is, to be honest, amazing. This is not really a review of the book, but I can really recommend it, especially if you like cooking. I don't, but there's lore descriptions, so yeah, and I need to do a video on it. If you don't really like cooking, there are the small lore descriptions with basically every dish. And they are sometimes really surprisingly detailed. So yeah, I can recommend the book. Not sponsored by the way. Although I wish I was. 
but I'm not. Anyway, next up, let's talk about the Tamriel calendar. How the months and the weeks and the days work on Tamriel. When talking about the Tamriel calendar, we are in a sense actually talking about an almost exact copy of the Gregorian calendar that most people use in our world. You know, the calendar that currently makes it 2019. There are seven days in every week, Morndas, Tirdas, Midas, Turdas, Freydas, Loradas and Sundas. As probably already you noticed, these are quite similar names to the days in our own universe. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. With some names like Sundas being basically almost exactly the same, except for day being replaced by the Tamrielic word for day, Das. Every day has 24 hours, although the time progression rate is much faster in game. In one Skyrim play session you can basically experience multiple days or even weeks. Uh, same in the Elder Scrolls Online, although in that game days are longer than in Skyrim. This is most likely just the result of the developers judging what progression rate fits every game uh, to make the gameplay streamlined. So for lore, let's just say that their hours take the same hours as our 24 day hours and that in lore their hours are the same amount of time as they are in our universe. In some dialogues and lore books there's even mention of the word minutes and seconds, so it's safe to make assumption that in lore people in the Elder Scrolls universe live with the same time speed as us. Just like in our own universe, the year consists out of 365 days and is split off in 12 months that have the same amount of days as their counterparts in our universe. There's Morning Star, equivalent of January with 31 days, Sun's Dawn, equivalent of February with 28 days, First Seed for March with 31 days, Rain's Hand for April with 30 days, followed by Second Seed, Mid-Year, Sun's Height, Last Seed, Hard Fire, Frostfall, Sun's Dusk and finally Evening Star, equivalent of December ending the year. This is interesting to consider the naming of the months, uh, considering the first month is called Morning Star, named after the stars you can still make out in the sky when the sun is rising in the morning, and Evening Star being the last month named after the stars which appear after the day has ended. So essentially, the year is just a metaphor for a day in the Elder Scrolls universe. And then you have the seed months, first seed, second seed, last seed, likely all named after the moments where Tamrielic farmers sow their seeds in the years, and Frostfall to coincide with the coming of the winter. All in all, I really like the names given to the Tamrielic months. I even like some more than our own months, if I'm being honest, but I don't think there's a chance that the world leaders will adapt the Tamrielic calendar instead of the Gregorian calendar, so let's just give up on that hope right now. <laughs> all months also have an associated constellation, which affects a person's traits whenever they are born in the associated months on Tamriel. These are called birth signs, although this was changed up in later games like Skyrim, where they are more or less replaced by the standing stones. So I don't know how prevalent that still is. Now, another interesting thing to note is that Tamriel does not have a leap day. Our 29th of February does not exist every four years in the universe of the Elder Scrolls. Uh, now I'm not going into the exact reason as to why we have a leap day, but very simplified it has something to do with the fact that our calendar is imperfect and needs an extra day every four years to more or less get back on track with our cycle around the sun. The fact that Tamriel doesn't have it uh, could mean that the sun cycle of Nern, if it even has a cycle in that sense, which is debated, is actually a perfect fit to the Gregorian calendar without a leap year, which is very interesting. But most likely this is just a small oversight by the developers who wanted to make the sense of time in the Elder Scrolls universe closer to ours, as to, not, as to not confuse players. But if you want to explain it the way using lore, it would mean that the cycle that Nern makes around the sun, by some called Magnus, or the cycle Magnus makes around Nern, depending on what you believe, is a perfect fit for the Gregorian calendar, other than our universe, where it isn't. Now an inconsistency in this is that the calendar in Tamriel used to be different. Uh, during the Imperial Simulacrum, so the period of the Elder Scrolls Arena, and also in the period which Daggerfall takes place, the calendar used to consist of 12 months, all comprised of 30 days. Why this is, we don't know. Most likely after the Empire getting its stuff back together, after both games, uh, someone just decided to switch back to the Gregorian calendar copy as that one was already practiced in the second era during Elder Scrolls Online, so we don't know why the Empire decided to suddenly change up the calendar, why they made this change, we don't know, why they changed it back, we don't know, but if I have to guess it's because probably this is just not to be explained by lore, it's probably because Bethesda found 30 days convenient to program for Arena and for Daggerfall, so let's just not look too far into that from a lore perspective anymore. And that was a short overview of the basics of the Tamriel calendar. Now, for the last bit of lore in this video, let's talk about the beauty standards on Tamriel. We already talked about this in my large video on useless lore on Tamriel, but I feel like this fits right into this. So first of all I want to make clear that what is considered beautiful is really a subjective personal thing. 
Now, for example, we have NPCs in the games which really don't adhere to the beauty standards for their cultures. And yet their partner or the person crushing on them is absolutely smitten by their looks. So don't think of this video as how your character needs to look to be attractive, as that's a whole different discussion. Rather, think of this video as a general discussion on what kind of physical attributes are appreciated or are considered beautiful, handsome, sexy by the mainstream masses of a certain culture. Alright, that being said, something which we can basically say about all the races is that in their culture the attributes of a healthy and clean body seem to be generally appreciated. For example, people with disease-ridden skin, for example corpus disease marks on one's skin, are regarded as less attractive than those with a clean, even skin tone. Uh, from some NPC dialogue we can also discern that while weight is not really something the people on Tamriel care about, uh, either too thin or too fat people do seem to be considered less attractive by the masses. And finally something that I can say about all the races with some certainty is that clean teeth also seem to be appreciated in almost every culture, as most cultures seem to have some popular objects to clean your teeth with. But that is about all that I can say about the general population of Tamriel, as each culture seems to have their own standards to a degree. Now, we don't know as much about each of the races as I would personally have liked. For example, most human races we know very little concrete information about, while with the elves and the beast races we generally have a bit more. So, let's start with the human races. While most human races seem to appreciate a healthy looking person, the exact specifications of what's considered to be healthy can vary. For example, we know that in Nordic culture, being a sturdy and strong person is considered very attractive. Both men and women with tall, muscled physique tend to be regarded as attractive, while slim and short people are considered to be less so. For both men and women, long hair seems to be the preference, with both men and women braiding their hair, but especially women. Now, beards are considered almost a must for a man in Nordic culture, as they add to the sturdy and strong image. And generally the North seem to prefer the people to be more natural in terms of their bodies and don't really care about stuff like body hair. For example, ear and nose hair seem to be somewhat appreciated by the Nords as it adds to the sturdiness and naturalness, like with beards. Now, the Bretons and the Imperials seem to be the complete opposite of that, seemingly preferring women to be shorter and less muscled. Uh, a muscled physique for men does seem to be appreciated, but not in the same way as the Nords. I mean, height doesn't really seem to matter as much, and personal grooming is an absolute must, especially with the Bretons. I mean, nose hair is just a no-go, it seems, and if you must have a beard, then Imperials and Bretons appreciate regular trimming and cleaning. Many Imperial and Breton NPCs also seem to consider dark hair to be a bit more attractive than blonde hair, while the Nords don't really seem to care about your hair color. Now, a final thing about the Imperial specifically is that in women they do seem to appreciate a slim physique and long hair, as the statues and depictions of the beauty ideal, the goddess of beauty and sexual attraction, the Bella, uh, in that those statues she is always portrayed as having a slim figure and long hair, uh, and the depictions of her that we see are almost always the Imperial depictions of the goddess, so that's why I say it. Now, for the Red Guards, their goddess of beauty and fertility, Morwa, is usually depicted with large breasts, and considering the focus on her bosom in her worship, there's a good chance that in Red Guard culture, larger breasts are considered to be more beautiful. Although we don't have any lore which explicitly states it to be so, just like with the Debella statue conclusion with the Imperials. Now, what we do know for sure is that the Red Guards actually put a bigger emphasis on hairstyling than the other cultures, for both men and women. Elaborate hair braids and dreadlocks are deeply ingrained in the culture and are considered quite attractive, regardless of their hair length. They, just like the Bretons and the Imperials, also seem to appreciate personal grooming. For example, untrimmed nails are considered quite unattractive, and beards also need to be trimmed regularly. Now, one other thing I found is that rather than black eyeshadow, Redguard women with bronzish eyeshadow seem to be considered more attractive than those with black or blue or any other color of eyeshadow. Alright, next up let's talk about the orcs. We know very little about the orcs other than that we know that they really appreciate tusk grooming. So clean tusks which have been sharpened and even shined. Now, there are multiple brands of tusk shine that we can find in the Elder Scrolls Online's contraband and by far the funniest one is called Uncle Brook's tusk shine. But it's far from the only one, like there are multiple. But other than that, just like the Norse, they seem to appreciate a sturdy physique most of the time, with muscles for both men and women being somewhat of an ideal. But other than that, and just the groomed tusks, we really just don't know anything about the orcs. 
Now, a culture that we also don't know that much about are the Bosmer. We um, know exactly three things, at least from what I could find. They find sharp and pointy teeth, very attractive, so more animal-like teeth. They tend to find tiger and cat-like eyeshadow, very attractive. And they also really like horns. Uh, it's a bit unclear how Bosmer horns work. Some sources claim they are all cosmetic additions made from creatures that the Bosmer hunted or magically grown to make them more bestial. While other sources claim that some Bosmer are actually born with horns. So we don't really know how that works, but regardless of how it works, fake horns or not fake horns, Bosmer really find horns to be very attractive. And concluding on this, I think it can straight up be said that the Bosmer tend to appreciate a more bestial form. But other than that, we don't really know all that much. But I suppose that just like the Nords, they most likely enjoy someone's body to be more natural rather than very cosmetic, since they are going for the whole bestial thing. Alright, so next up are the Dark Elves, or the Dunmer. We know a bit more about them. For example, it seems that smooth skin is considered more attractive than the uneven skin that some Dark Elves are born with. They seem to be the only race to actively make skin cream for smooth skin, which is actually pretty interesting. And personal grooming is an absolute must. Body hair seems to be looked down upon very much. And nails need to be trimmed. Beards, if you must have them, need to be regularly maintained. And they're also one of the primary users of lip paint, so essentially lipstick. It also seems that natural red hair among the Dunmer seems to be considered more attractive than dark or either white hair. Now, if you were somewhat disappointed so far about the amount of lore that we have, let me assure you that the final three races either have more lore to them or have quite interesting lore when it comes to beauty standards. So, first let's finish up talking about the elven races with the Altmer or the High Elves. Traditionally, Altmer are extremely superficial and really care about looks and more specifically how elvish one looks. More human qualities in outward appearance are deemed less attractive and in very conservative Altmer circles just having some human genes from a far off human ancestor is already problematic. One of the greatest qualities to have for traditional Altmer is very sharp ears because sharper ears signify less human ancestors. But not just that, I mean sharp facial features are considered attractive because humans tend to have more rounded faces. Height is also one of these features. High elves tend to be taller than humans, thus the taller one is, the more attractive that they are considered to be. And finally, more yellowish golden skin is also considered to be the most attractive as human ancestors cause for either lighter or darker skin, which is considered less attractive in most conservative Altmer circles. But it's not just important not to have human qualities. Symmetry of the face is also very important to many. As is symmetrical bone structure, the right width between the eyes, nose not being too big, not too large. In general, very average facial features seem to be important and almond is considered to be the very best eye color as green, blue, brown, etc. are all considered to be the result of human or other racial ancestors. And beards with the high elves are generally a no-go in conservative circles, save for extremely well-kept short beards or moustaches for older men. Basically anything dirty or considered brutish is considered to be too human-like and thus not really considered attractive. Because of these really superficial standards, far stricter than any other race or culture, face sculpting magic and face sculptors using it are actually quite common in the Somerset Isles, as people will use magic to adhere to the beauty standards. Now, it's important to note here that we know that these things come from very conservative Altmer circles. It's likely that most not too conservative Altmer appreciate some of these qualities, sure, but don't really adhere to them very strictly and may find other things attractive as well. We don't really know how much of the high elf population at this point is still that conservative, but it's a section of the population that we just know most about. So be sure to take these standards with a bit of a grain of salt, as in less conservative Altmer circles it's definitely not that strict most likely. That being said, the final two races that we do need to talk about are the beast races, and let's start with the Khajiit. Interestingly enough, since there are so many types of Khajiit or fur stocks as they call it themselves, a video on that is in the description if you haven't seen it, it seems that there aren't really any body types or fur patterns which are considered especially attractive in Khajiiti culture, likely because there are so many different ones. That being said, there are a few universal rules for Khajiiti attractiveness it seems to be, some of which I personally find to be pretty hilarious. A great example is of how straight and unbroken whiskers are one of the sexiest things for a Khajiit apparently. Khajiit take this very seriously. I mean, 
very seriously. Some of them even use little clips to bind their whiskers to bamboo twigs while they sleep, so their whiskers don't wrinkle in their sleep. Good stuff. Other than that, they have a saying, claws make the cat, meaning that their claws need to be polished, neatly trimmed and sharp to boot. Now, the Khajiit ideal is smooth and unknitted fur, which appears sleek and shiny to the eye. Because of this, there are many fur products to make their fur shine and fur brushes to untangle knits in the fur, as knitted fur seems to be a signal of being untidy and slobbish. Now, a final thing to note about Kajiti beauty standards is that green eyes are apparently considered to be especially attractive, as they are quite rare. Now, finally, we have the Argonians, who are an interesting case, as one of the things that the Argonians seem to appreciate is a strong smell. While the other races have all kinds of perfumes to mask any smells, Argonians seem to find it attractive in some cases, which is interesting. Now, something else which the Argonians really appreciate are sharp and shiny horns on their head. Uh, we have some items which suggest that they both regularly sharpen and wax their horns. But in terms of wax, it's not just their horns, because they apparently also wax their scales, as clean and shiny scales are considered to be very attractive to many Argonians. And one funny little tidbit is that some of the chemicals that they use to clean their scales can actually burn the skin of other races or cause extreme rashes. So, uh, yeah, do with that knowledge what you want. Now, unlike most other races, smooth skin is actually not that attractive, as skin ridges and wrinkles are considered to be very nice to look at in Argonian society. Now, having talked about all the races, I have to admit that this is not a full, full picture, but it's basically everything we know in terms of confirmed lore, at least what I could find after 30 hours of research on the log. I mean, what I found is not that much, but it's quite interesting nonetheless, and I sincerely hope that you enjoyed learning about it. As this is just all there is, seemingly. Uh, you know, this video actually started out as a Patreon request for me to find Tamriel's most attractive man or woman in history. I uh, didn't really find much except for the very short story of Maka of the Piercing Eyes, who was a female harbinger of Skyrim's companions, who was apparently so beautiful that everybody underestimated her because of it, but who was allegedly able to slay an army single-handedly. But that's not really something I may make a video on, since that literally is all that we know. So, yeah, not really fully video material. Anyway, now you've reached the end of this very long collection of Tamrielic traditions. If you like that, consider watching my regular lore videos, as this is basically just a collection of my regular 10 to 20, sometimes 40 minute lore videos that I upload every week. Or wait for the next collection, if that's your kind of thing. I'll be uploading them a little bit more often, and I hope that you enjoyed them. Anyway, if you watched this far into the video, I honestly don't know what to tell you. You watched more than two hours of content. You know what? Let me know by saying, let's say, use the word rose in your comment. That would get people confused, probably. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this video. And if you did, consider subscribing, liking, all that kind of stuff. I'm going. Goodbye. I'll see you in the next little video. Bye-bye.